All about the Limniads, Part 1, Trade and Translation. Limniads are as successful on trade routes that one might expect. While their homeworld does not offer a great amount of resources, the Limniads themselves are excellent traders. Perhaps they are excellent traders because the homeworld does not offer a great amount of trade desirable resources. One reason that Limniads make such excellent traders is that they have an ear for languages. They can learn a language well enough to conduct trade in less than a year. This leaves them less reliant on translation implants and software translation issues. There have been some claims that the newest species in the aggregate can learn a language faster than that, but the many rumors about humans will be dispelled in our forthcoming publication about humans. The Care and Feeding of Humans Written by Dibiak Review of Ontological Species Studies All About Linmiads Trade and Translation Published by Glass and Steel, all about Linmead's translation engine 3.1415. Where's my arm? Has anyone seen my arm? Zoe asked from behind her bed. She appeared to be looking under the bed for a missing arm. You um, lost your arm, Zoe. That seems kind of uh, careless, Alan said with a smile. Everyone was hanging out in Zoe's room. Zoe was still packing, or would have been except, Where's my flipping arm? Zoe demanded, coming up from behind the bed. Zoe looked at Bubsy, who was chewing on something, but it didn't look like a whole arm. Bubsy, Zoe said in a warning tone, and Bubsy froze, looking at Zoe with big eyes. Bubsy, give me my arm. Bubsy dropped what she'd been chewing and covered it with her paws. Zoe stood up and walked over to the kitten. When they'd first adopted Bubsy a little over two months ago, she'd been the size of an earth kitten. Now she was the size of a corgi. You still pick her up and hold her, but carrying her for long distances wasn't the best choice. Bubsy, Zoe said. Her tone was mild, but still held warning. Give me my arm. Bubsy put her head down and looked away. Okay, Bubsy. You asked for it. Zoe picked the kitten up and cuddled her into her left arm, since the right arm was missing below the elbow. Once Bubsy was up in the air, Zoe's prosthetic arm was clearly visible. Bubsy had been lying on top of it and chewing on the fingers. Tariff picked up Zoe's arm. Here it is, Zoe. I can't believe you lost it in this little room, he teased her, and Zoe let Bubsy down. Robbed of her favorite toy, Bubsy headed over to Nerif for consolation pats and scritches. Nerif was happy to oblige. Tariff examined Zoe's arm and said, It looks fine, except for the cat hair. Zoe snatched the arm from Tariff and headed for the refreshing room. The sound of running water indicated that Zoe was trying to wash the cat hair off the arm. Zoe came back out in a few minutes, using her left arm to twist the right arm into place. Zoe finished tossing new things into a luggage droid and gave it a pat to let it know to close up. She held up Bubsy's leash and Bubsy abandoned Nerif for a fun of a walk. Well, I know where I stand, Nerif said and she corrected herself. Sit. She stood up, as did the rest of the team. Nate, Quirif, Anna, and Tariff headed out the door. Zoe snapped Bubsy's leash onto her harness and checked to make sure that the harness fit well. You just checked her harness yesterday, Nerif pointed out. She's growing pretty fast, and I worry that I won't fit from day to day, Zoe said. She bent over and pet Fuzzy behind the ears. The team had spent a month after Nerif's release from ISO quarantine working with Fubsy, getting her to agree to a harness and a leash, getting her used to crowds of people and transports and walkways and all of the hundreds and hundreds of things that they were designed to freak a kitten out. Fubsy did very well, though it did take a number of treats and field trips to get her to get a relaxed kitten that she was now. If Fubsy could deal with that today, Nerif thought, it'll all be worth it. Today, they were boarding the ship for the next contract. While the contract had specified the human Linmi had make up their team, they'd only described Fubsy as a feline. As they boarded the ship, a figure in a giant hat and a feather approached them. The feather was a giant and impressive plume, and almost hid the hat under the wafting flutters. Greetings, fair expedition team. I am your captain, your Sharon, your conveyor to destiny, and I bid you welcome. He took off his hat and waved it in a large, elegant sweep, while he bowed deeply to the team. You may call me Captain John Rackham. 
Bubsy, who had been well behaved until this moment, could not resist the large feather moving in front of her and pounced on the Captain Rackham's hat, carrying it from his hand. Captain Rackham was a troll, a species known for their size and strength as much as their good humor. And he looked down at Bubsy's mooring his hat with a surprise and a smile. And who is this fearsome beast who has so easily destroyed the dangerous hat with a feather? He asked. I'm sorry, Captain. Uh, we'll replace the hat. Uh, this is Bubsy, uh, our pet fell on, Zoe said, while trying to retrieve the hat. Bubsy relinquished the hat, but kept the feather. It is of no matter, Captain Rackham said, with a wave of his hand. If I had remembered my Earth biology better, I would have remembered the cat's kill birds, and surely would have realized that the hat would have fallen to any feline with dignity. He turned to Fubsy, still trying to catch the feather in her mouth. Though it was stuck in her paws, so every time she moved, the feather quivered just out of reach of her mouth. To you, dear lady, he then looked up at Zoe. Fubsy is a lady, is she not? Sometimes, Zoe agreed. To you, dear lady, Captain Rackham said again. I give thanks for saving me from the predation of the said bird. Then he bowed again to Fubsy. This time, Nerf noticed he did not wave the hat about, but held it across his chest and bowed. As for your accommodations, he said to Nerf as her role as liaison, we have a suite of quarters normally reserved for any other trolls that may be traveling with us. I believe they'll fit your requirements of a shared living space with differential sleeping quarters. Thank you, Captain Rackham, Nerf said. We are a team and like to keep our bonds strong. But Nate snores. Hey, Nate said, and then added, only when I'm asleep. I also have for you your navigational bracelets. Nareth didn't see where he pulled the bracelets from. One second his hands were empty, and the next he had seven bracelets in his hand. One for each of you, he handed them out, and one for Fubsy. He looked at Fubsy and looked at the bracelet and said, Maybe you can fix it to a harness. Captain Rackon turned back to the team. We will have our initial meeting about the expedition in seven bells, ship time, approximately two hours after we depart this fair planet. All available data will be handed out at the time. You will then have time to read and discuss the material. At eight bells tomorrow morning, we will have a second meeting for any questions. I must now attend to my fine ship. I trust that you can find your own way to your quarters. This time, his bow involved clicking his heels together and tipping slightly forward from the waist. As Nareth watched him walk away, she leaned close to Quirf's ear. Who exactly picked this expedition? Quirf smiled and shrugged. Nate and Zoe both did, mostly because he needed a team of six and that's what we had. Alan had turned on his navigation. The blue light was patiently waiting to take them to their quarters. The team started down the hall. Bubsy had finally seized the feather in her mouth and was now prancing proudly as she carried it along with her, even when it dragged on the floor or brushed the wall. Nerif tapped her bracelet. Set alarm to guide us to meeting at seven bells tonight, the bracelet said. Alarm set five minutes to seven bells. Nerif turned to Zoe. So, um, shall we bring Fubsy to the meeting tonight? Zoe pointed at the now very bedraggled feather in Fubsy's mouth. I don't think she should meet anyone else that might be dressed like our captain was. Uh, let's warn them about her plume fetish before we actually meet. End of chapter. It's all about the Linmats, part two, team players. Linmats are make for great team members. Whether your team is an expedition team, a diplomatic team, or a trading team, they are easy to get along with, don't struggle for leadership positions, and take orders well. They aren't just support personnel and shouldn't be treated as lackeys. They are creative thinkers, though they may be a little more timid than other species and require a gentle hand when they are on your team. Diviak Review Ontological Species Studies, all about Linmeads, team players, published by Glass and Steel, all about Linmeads, translation engine 3.1415. The quarters were quite nice, and because it was originally designed for a troll group, there were nine rooms for the six of them. 
Admittedly, the nine rooms were small, but since they were for sleeping, no one really cared. One of the refresher rooms had been retrofitted with a rejuvenation pod for the rifts, and the main room was well suited as a gathering area for the six of them and Fubsy. Fubsy immediately tried to grab a small ottoman and make off with it, but was foiled by the magnetic feet that kept it attached to the floor in case of gravity failure. If there's anything missing, or something that you would like changed, Narrow said to the team, let me know before the meeting tonight. As liaison, it is my job to get that fixed for you. Once they were unpacked and barely settled in, the door rang for attention. Tariff was still unpacking his knives, but was closest to the door so opened it, not paying attention to the boning knife that he had in his hand. While certainly not the biggest knife he owned, it probably still looked impressive to the Cree standing on the other side of the door. She didn't bat an eye though, and said, Captain's compliments, he asked me to let you know that we dress for dinner here on board the Nonsuch. If you don't have clothes suitable for this evening meal, you can requisition them before eight bells. Dress for dinner, Nate said. Did he think that we were going naked? I think, Tara said, they want us to dress in a fancy dress. Everybody looked towards the Cree, who smiled, her tail twitched. Yes, that is correct. Fancy dress, you may see some examples visible in the ship logs. Tara thanked her gravely, and then closed the door. As soon as it was shut, everyone grabbed their compad and looked at the pictures for dinner in the ship's logs. If, um, I have to eat in my room the entire trip, uh, as always said, I'm okay with that, as long as I don't have to wear that in public. Nera leaned over to see what Zoe was looking at. As dresses go, it was probably fine. It was yellow and purple, so Nareff was sure that Zoe wasn't objecting to the color. It did seem to have an excessive amount of ruffles that cascaded down the front of the dress, over the hands and down to the floor. Well, you could wear this. Nara showed Zoe the picture that she was looking at. The dress was very red, but close to the body and had a slit up one side that went from the floor to the wearer's hip bone. The man wearing it really looked good. Or, um, Zoe said, we could all go dressed like this. She flipped her compad over to show everyone a picture that she had found. A young person, dressed all in black, with black boots, a lace-up shirt, and a small cape over one shoulder. A mask and a hat. No, not nearly as big as the Captain Rackham's hat had been. Nate looked up from whatever picture he'd been looking at, and judging from the look at his face, Narev didn't want to know. Nate gave an approving nod to Zoe's choice. Zoe, you know better than that. Capes are just asking for problems. Querif was already punching in his order, with Tariff waiting right behind him. Nate and Alan decided on an outfit like Zoe's, but with no mask, no hat, and no cape. Zoe decided to add gloves to the hat, mask, and cape she picked out for her outfit. I'm torn, Nareff said. I want to dress like the team, but I also want a pretty yellow and purple dress, with maybe a few less ruffles, she added. Dress like the team for tonight, and then get your pretty dress for tomorrow, Alan advised her. Zoe made a choking noise. Dress like the team tonight, she said. Get a prettier dress for tomorrow, she corrected Alan. They made up quite a statement as a team, and Nareff admired her boots in the mirror. I may keep those, she said, instead of recycling them when the night is over. Tariff whipped up a dinner for Fubsy, who had moved onto the carnival formula number two, and a large tube bone that he had ordered when picking out his outfit. Hopefully, he said, this will keep her distracted enough that do not notice that we're gone for a while. Nareff's alarm went off with an unusual sound. Bates snickered. What is funny about it? Nareff asked. I understand how it's unusual, but not what makes it funny. It's funny, Alan said. Because it's a ship's bell, and Nate has an everlasting love for things pirate. When they walked into the dining hall, a few people were still filing in, but Captain Rackham was already seated at the head of the table. Evidently, his flair for the dramatic had extended to the dining hall. Nerev could see that he was decorated like pictures of sailing ships that Quirif had read and reread as a nymphling. When Captain Rackham saw them, he stood up, spread out his arms, and said, Welcome, guests! The crew and the ship was dressed in fancy dress from a wide variety of eras and planets, but Captain Rackham was firmly dressed in the Earths of the late 1600s. His hat, Nareff noticed, was different from the one he'd worn earlier in the day. 
and this one had no feather. But uh, where is your darling Fobsy? Captain Rackham asked. She's uh, dining in our quarters tonight, Zoe said. We were afraid she might go after featherhead hats during dinner, and that's always awkward. I understand. In my youth, some friends and I visited one of your uh, <laughs> cat cafes. I am not sure Rio ever recovered from the event, Captain Rackham answered with gravity. But please sit, eat. Nera flicked through all the ways the cat could damage someone and sat down at the place with her name on it, before asking, Your friend, uh, Brio, what happened to him? The captain paused, a mouthful of food inhabiting his answer, and then swallowed before saying he decided to give up his career as a ship engine designer and become a cat cafe owner. He ate another bite and then said, At last I heard he had a chain of them on Rylas three. Dinner was not a quiet conversational meal that Nerif had come to expect from her previous expeditions. Captain Rackham seemed to favor singing loud songs about drinking that involved lots of slamming of the drinking cups on the table in set rhymes and tossing the glasses around. Nate, Querif, and Alan joined in in gusto. Tariff was more interested in exploring the assortment of food on their plates. The food was good, but strange. Zoe, who was seated next to Nera, leaned over and said, I think our captain has a thing for us. The food, the decor, the songs. Once dinner was over, the captain had the desserts served. It was a dark cake with a creamy liquid poured over it and set on fire. Nera picked up a cup, prepared to pour her drink on the fire, but Zoe stopped her. It's fine, it'll burn out in a minute. After the flaming dessert, which was good, but hot, the rest of the diners left the room, leaving only the captain's table still occupied. As the other people left the room, the lights grew dim around them, until finally, only the captain's table was lit. He tapped his bracelet and a sound file started playing, but rather than music, it was the sound effect of a vessel on the ocean. Having been raised on an ocean world, Nerif knew the sounds well. Now, here's the expedition you've been hired for, the captain Rackham said, his voice slightly lowered, as though someone might overhear the conversation. He handed each of them a team packet. Nate was the first to open his packet. He made a little gasp and said, <gasps> A treasure map? Then he put his hand over his mouth to hide a smile, but there was no hiding the delight in his eyes. We're going on a treasure hunt on a death world. End of chapter. All about the Linmeads, part three. Family nest. Linmead families can be complicated to an outsider. Mothers form friendship bonds with other mothers. Once the friendship bonds are formed, they will nurture their children together in a single dwelling place. These children are regarded as siblings even though they share no genetic component. The terms used by Linmeads for the siblings relationship is Nesta. Linmeads only form this Nesta relationship with other Linmeads. There are no examples of cross-species nesting. The Beak Review of Ontological Species Studies, All About Linmeads, Family Nest, published by Glass and Steel, All About Linmeads, Translation Engine 3.1415. You are correct, Captain Rackham said. A small smile played along his lips. A treasure hunt on a death world now. I'd like you to read the information tonight. Tomorrow you bring your dear cat to breakfast in my quarters and we'll discuss any questions you have. I have questions right now, said Zoe, and she closed the folder on the table. The captain looked at her, one eyebrow lifted. Why do you need humans? Zoe asked. It's a Death World 3, Captain Rackham admitted, and if you're going on a Death World, it is best to have humans on the team. In this case, humans and a support team. You'll be taking me along because it's my charter, but for 3 we could do a lot of different races. The real reason is we need humans because the map was written in human. Nerif looked down at the map. Any good translation program could deal with the distances, but I don't see any measurements here at all. Captain Rackham nodded. It says it's gibberish, but I'm pretty sure that there is not gibberish to humans. Nate recovered enough to say, But do we know about the person who made the map? Rackham said, We know three things. He was a human, he was male, and he is dead. How did you end up with the map? Querif asked. I was sent to me by a friend, Captain Rackham said. Oh, this whole thing stinks. 
Break sty, Evans, Alan agreed. Tara asked Alan, Is that how your psychic powers manifest? Through sense of smell? Zoe sighed and said, You don't need to be psychic to know the captain is hiding something. Just look at the way he's avoiding questions. The captain had the good grace to look a little embarrassed at Zoe's pointed comment. Nerys said, But he answered all of your questions. Zoe snorted. Answers that gave no information. They weren't answers. They were delaying tactics, which just adds more questions. Like what? Like, why is he trying to delay? Nate said. And what's the treasure? Zoe asked. Captain Rackham looked at her and said, Do you need to know to do the job? Zoe shook her head. Probably not. But if you're honest with us, we'll have no problem being honest with you. Then it may help figure out what we're looking for and what some of these things mean. Like this part. It says start on the Isle of View. I'm guessing that's an island of the world we're heading for. But more information will be helpful. Captain Rackham looked at his remaining crew around the table and nodded at them. They left, and the darkness grew around the table, till only the seven of them were in the light. The man was a friend of Ida. I hadn't seen him since school. He was an exchange student, first human I'd ever met. We, we'd lost touch over the years, uh, then I got a message from him. Said he was working on something big, but he didn't trust the people he was working for. He was going to try and get away. Captain Rackham looked at his drink and it slowly turned between his palms, the amber fluid swirling gently in the glass. I think he got away, but uh, they were still on his trail. I think that's why the map was written in human, even though he wanted me to find it. I think he was trying to keep it away from them. So, um, if he was a friend of yours, you know a lot more than just he's human, he's male, he's dead, Alan pointed out. I do. And I think some of it may come in handy on our treasure hunt, Captain Rackham said. And what exactly is the treasure? Zoe prompted. Captain Rackham looked at her. It's an FTL drive ship that can land on a planet. Wow, Alan said. That could be huge. Captain Rackham nodded. Nate gave the captain a hard look. And who is it that is after your friend? Captain Rackham returned Nate's look. It was the glint. There was a long silence. Nero thought that perhaps Zoe and Nate all might have had an outburst, but they were still. Almost absent-mindedly, Alan stuffed one of the dinner rolls into his pocket. Blindly, Nate broke the silence. You think the Glint are still after this? Captain Rackton nodded once. I do. Then you want to delay answering more questions until tomorrow because... Nate asked. Because tomorrow we'll be out of the system. Tomorrow we can jump to the planet that I believe has the FTL drive we're looking for. Because once we jump, the glimp won't have an easy time tracking us. Because you mark my words, Captain Rackin said. They want this drive. They've been pretty much driven out of the aggregate. And the only thing that they have to sell is glint rehost. And that's a small market. If they could produce this FTL drive, then that lets them land directly on a planet. They would be brought back into the aggregate with a joyous celebration. He looked at the human seated at the table and then looked down again when he spoke his voice was very quiet. Despite what they did to you. Friggin' Glint, Nate said. Zoe looked at Nate. Okay, Captain, she said, never taking her eyes off Nate. We'll do it. End of story. Part 4. Message in a Bubble Because Lemnians evolved from a warm-blooded water species, they are excellent swimmers. Both their fingers and toes are webbed, which allows for excellent propulsion through water. They also are capable of communicating with each other underwater in a complex system of sound bursts against the skin. The sonar can travel great distances and the message will arrive with little distortion. Do be a review of ontological species studies, all about Linmead's message in a bottle. Published by Glass and Steel, all about Linmead's translation engine 3.1415. After dinner, the team headed back to their quarters to review the mission folders and check on Fubsy. Fubsy helped with the mission review by laying on the mission folders, pulling folders out of people's hands, or just getting in between people and their folders. Fubsy, I adore you, but you're a pain, Zoe said, after Fubsy pulled her folder out of her hands for the second time. Nerif looked at Fubsy with furrowed brows. What are you thinking? Tariff asked. 
about Bobsy and how we are. Nerf's dead and Zoe jumped. Let's not talk about that in here, Zoe said. We don't know who may be listening. Nerf rolled her eyes. If the captain was listening to every room, the odds of him listening to us at this moment would be pretty low. Except, Nate said, we're the new shiny thing. I figure he's listening to us all the time. We need to talk about this, Nerf said. I can't believe we haven't talked about it before. I don't know what we were thinking. She looked at Bubsy again. We'll pass notes, Alan said. Like in school, I even got a pencil and a paper. He rummaged around in his gear and pulled them out. See? The team moved back to the table, and Alan handed the tools to Nero. You write down what you want to talk about. Keep it hidden, in case he's got cameras in here too. Pass the note around. We'll make comments on the paper and pass it around again. Nero bit a lip and nodded. She wrote out, We are addicted to Pubsy. We've brought Bubsy into a closed system. How do we stop everyone else from getting addicted to Bubsy? And what do we do when, if they do get addicted? She handed the paper to Alan. He read it, nodded, and wrote it down. Good question. You're right. How do we not think of this? Alan handed a note to Quirif, who added, Maybe Bubsy's addiction keeps us from looking at it too closely. Zoe took the note and scribbled her thoughts on it. We never saw signs of anyone getting addicted to Bubsy before we left the transit hotel. Even the people that saw every day, like the desk clerk. I think something else is at play, other than just proximity to Bubsy. Tariff then added his own thoughts. We should all think back to when we started caring for Bubsy. See what we can remember. Maybe we can find a common element. Alan wrote, I loved her from the moment I saw her. I heard a little cry and picked her up and... Uh, my heart just melted. Nate wrote, You're a softie. I don't think your experience counts. However, I loved her from the beginning, too. She was so fragile and soft and sweet, even when she bit me. That was cute. Nerf wrote, Only Alan could fall in love with something that tried to get him. All I remember from the start is that she tried to eat his head. No, so he corrected. She grabbed onto him and didn't want to let go. But you're right. As humans, we're probably not the best indicator of when the addiction kicked in. Nareth thought back. I fell in love with her that night in the big storm. She crawled into my lap and wouldn't leave. Every time I tried, she just sunk her claws in deeper. At first, I was scared, because apex predator sticking me with claws. But then, I just seemed sweet. She went back and underlined that blast bit. Tariff puzzled over this, and then wrote... I don't remember Fubsy clawing me. Quarif wrote, She bit you a lot when she was wanting her food. Me too. In fact, she bit or clawed all of us. The fact that we're okay with that seems, uh, weird. Well, not for you humans, but for us, mostly sane folk. After this message was shared, everyone looked at Fubsy. She was chewing on something, and then she saw them looking at her. She froze. She dropped the thing and covered it up with her paw, while still watching them. Okay, then, Zoe said as she stood up. She took the note and crumpled it up. Does anyone have any objections to me destroying this? The captain wants us to bring Fubsy to his quarters in the morning, Nera reminded them. Prudence would dictate that we leave her here, but the smart response would be for us to keep the captain happy, Nate said with a wink. And bring her along. We'll just make sure that keep her in her harness. At eight bells in the morning, they were outside the captain's quarter. Bubsy was pleased to be out and about and had sniffed the passing crew members, but hadn't been offended that no one wanted to pet her. Alan was offended on her behalf. I, they don't know what they're missing, girl, she told Bubsy with a great sincerity. Then he gave her an extra pet to make up for the one she didn't get from the crew members. Captain Racken opened the door to his quarters. Welcome, welcome, perfect timing. Breakfast is just being served. I know what an important meal this is for you, and you, dear Fubsy, we have breakfast for you as well. Fubsy seemed suddenly shy with the full force of the captain's personality directed at her, and she hid behind Nerf's legs and then peered out at the captain. The captain wore a more sedate costume than the night before, but the fact that the black boots and lace-up shirts were not normally seen on FTL ships did not dissuade him from his clothing choices in the least. 
His quarters were totally in keeping with everything that they learned about Captain Rackham in the past few hours. Lined wood, a fancy window that looked onto a viewing screen that showed what the sky would look like if they weren't traveling by FTL. Brass, hanging lights, and red velvet pillows scattered on chairs around the wooden table. Finally, the computer access point was disguised to look like an old wooden campaign desk. Nate might have made a little squeak when he saw that room. The final and crowning glory, however, were the various flags hung on the walls. The droids finished laying out the food, and one droid said, Eight bells and all's wells, Captain. Then the droids left, leaving the team alone with the captain. Come, sir, to eat, he urged them. Bubsy needed no urging and headed over to the dish on the floor that was evidently set aside for her. She's uh, much bigger than I remember kittens being, Captain Rackenham observed. He sat down at the end of the table close as Bubsy and reached out a hand to her. When she flicked her tail at him, he jerked his hand back and smiled. It's just like the perfect balance between desire and fear. I want to touch her and yet... And yet, Zoe agreed, she was already seated at the table, sitting on the captain's right, so she could keep Bubsy under control. The Riffs were sitting down and Nate and Alan were already grabbing food. None of you look injured, Captain Rackett said. No missing body parts, no visible scars. Has a dear lady ever injured you? Eraf laughed. A few minutes after being rescued, she attacked Alan's head. He was bleeding from several spots. Hey, she didn't mean anything by it. She just didn't understand how to use her claws, Alan protested around a mouthful of bread. Zoe is missing an arm, Tariff said helpfully, but Fubsy didn't have anything to do with that. As they ate, the topic turned from Fubsy to the treasure map. I promised you a chance to ask questions and get answers, Captain Rackham said. We don't have a lot of questions this morning, Captain, so he said, but we do have one problem. We've read over the map and do not understand it one bit. It makes no sense. Do you even know what the island they're supposed to start on? Captain Rackham shook his head and tapped his bracelet. The lights in his cabin dimmed and projection of the planets spun slowly over the table like a chandelier. I was hoping you humans would be able to figure that out, what it meant. If not, there are only several islands to explore. We can pick one at random and see if we can discover any clues. I would recommend we start with the island where Steve was found. The captain gestured at the globe, shifting position, and enlarged one of the small islands. Holy crap, said Nate. Seriously? What is it? What do you see? asked the captain. The clue is start on the Isle of View, so he said. In our language, Isle of You sounds like I love you. And that island, she pointed at an outraged finger at the island in the middle of the map, that island is shaped like a freaking heart. No, it's not, Zoe, Quirif said. At least not a human heart or any heart that I've ever heard of. Not a real heart, Zoe confirmed. A symbol for the word heart in our language. The map is written in puns. Zoe put her head in her hands, and Fubsy came over and climbed into her lap. This is a nightmare, Zoe said. Exactly as Nate said, this is going to be awesome! End of chapter. All about the Limniads, part 5. Limniads of a Feather. Limniads communicate their emotions through three primary modes. First and most obvious is their feathers. The feathers on their scalp consist of short contour feathers and semi-plumes. The feathers may grow on the neck and a few Linmeads have feathers that trail down their spine. The contour feathers are usually iridescent blues and greens, while the semi-plumes are in blues and purples. The feathers may fluff, flatten, or crest depending on the emotions that the Linmead is feeding. Fluffing may indicate embarrassment or pride. Flattening usually indicates negative emotions, cresting especially with the semi-plumes indicates pride, confidence, or sexual arousal. However, it can also indicate anger. Linmiets also express emotions through skin color changes. The basic skin color set ranges in so-called watercolors. Embarrassment is indicated by ripples of purple color over the skin. When a Linmead starts overheating, their color shifts to a sun desert colors. Though this may not be instantly obvious to non Linmeads. The third way that Linmeads convey emotions is with facial expressions. 
well, not as diverse as the facial expressions of the Ruuna. They use more expressions than most other species in the aggregate. There have been some claims that the newer species in the aggregate use more facial expressions, but the many rumors about humans will be dispelled in our forthcoming publication about humans, the care and feeding of humans. Dubiak, Review of Ontological Species, All About Limniads, Limniads of a Feather, published by Glass and Steel, All About Limniads, Translation Engine 3.1415. While Zoe had her head in her hands, the captain's door rang for attention. Come! The captain shouted towards the door, and it opened in response to his command. One of the crew came in, another troll, of course, like the captain, and probably one of his family group, Nerif judged. She was wearing white pants and a shirt with blue and white horizontal stripes, and a floppy cap of some kind that Nareth didn't recognize. Captain, she said, and raised her hand to her forehead. Rogers, the captain said, while striking a head with his hand. Robot! Rogers removed her hand from her forehead and said, We've completed the first ping and have received an echo. Your suspicions were confirmed. We have a tracer on us. Captain Rackham nodded. Thank you, uh, That'll be all, Rogers. Keep me informed if the tracer sends out a signal when we drop from FTL. Rogers hit herself in the forehead with a hand and said, Very good, sir, and turned and left the cabin. You're dropping out of FTL when you know that you have a tracer on you? Quirif asked in disbelief. Quirif? Nerif shook her head at him. No, he is quite right to ask, Captain Rackham said. Alan spoke up. As soon as you drop out of FTL, that tracer is going to send a signal back to the glint and let them know exactly where you are. I, for one, would be perfectly happy keeping the glint in ignorance about my location forever. I am well aware of that, young friend, Captain Rackham said, his voice a little testy. I am avoiding and outwitting these tracers while you are but a grub. You can sleep well tonight, knowing that I have a plan. You... Can I have to share that plan, Captain? Date asked. There was no trace of his normal easy smile, and the look in his eyes made Nerif uncomfortable. The captain looked at Nate for a long time, then nodded. One short nod. I suppose it is easy to explain myself to anyone except my mating group, but you three. He nodded to include Alan, Nate, and Zoe. You have a history with the Glint. You rightly have concerns about them. You deserve to know my plans. He tapped his bracelet, and the room darkened. He tapped again, and the room filled the stars. We'll be dropping out of FTL here. One of the stars lit up. A shuttle will be leaving the ship and landing on a primary planet. The tracer will be sending a signal back to the scallywags that are following us. We'll be entering FTL and heading here. The second star lit up. We'll be dropping out of FTL and sending out another shuttle. We'll be doing the same here, here, and here, and here. I see what you're doing, I have said. You're setting out false trail. They don't know which one we'll actually be on. Captain Rackham smiled at Quarif. Exactly! They'll be wasting their time and resources searching every one of those stops we've made. Meanwhile, the non-such will be continuing around in a great circle and picking up shuttles that were dropped off before. We'll have about a week to figure out Steve's map. He picked up his drink, daring coffee by the smell of it, and held it up. Here's hoping that we can solve Steve's map and be back down the nonsuch, drinking to his memory an hour before the Clint even know that we were gone. The humans picked up their cups, and Nerif followed suit. Kurf and Turf quickly imitated her, and they all clinked their glasses together. They left soon after, and the captain stole a quick pat from Fubsy as she walked past him, heading out the door. They took Fubsy back to her quarters and then took a tour of the ship. As they walked through the ship, every time they passed a crew member, Nerif noticed that the crew members hit their foreheads with their hands as they passed by. Why are they doing that? Nerif asked Zoe. Doing what? Hitting themselves in the forehead, Nerif said. See? A troll crew member passed them, going in the opposite direction, and hit himself in the forehead with his hand. Zoe's lips twitched a smile as she struggled to keep hidden. They're saluting. I, I never thought the pirates saluting all that much, but I guess they might have. Why not just press their hands together like everyone else does in the aggregate? Nerif wondered. You may have noticed that the captain has a thing for Earth in general, and pirates in particular. It's a salute that they used on Earth before we were part of the aggregate, Zoe explained. 
Seems pretty dangerous, Nerif muttered. Zoe laughed. I guess it could be, if you didn't know how to do a salute. When they stopped by the gym, Alan was surprised that the equipment was actually being used. Nerif said, As the expedition team for the ship, you have priority for using the gym, but it might be better if we work out a schedule with the ship's crew. They headed back to their rooms, just in time to surprise a troll crew member walking away from their door. Oh, hello, he said. I was just checking you if you need anything. We will need to work out a schedule to use the gym, Nerif said. Okay, just um, uh, send a note to the quartermaster and she'll set up a schedule that works for you. If that's all, uh, bye. Zoe watched him with narrowed eyes as he headed down the hallway at a fast clip. Zoe, Nerif asked. What is it? They seemed suspicious. Zoe whirled back to the door. Bobsy! End of chapter. All about the Limniads, part six. Salt of the sea. Because Limniads evolved on an ocean world, they favor two things in their diet. Fish and sodium chloride, commonly known as salt. If you ever hire a Limniad chef, make sure he or she understands your salt intake preference. Runa, for obvious reasons, are best advised to not retain a Limniad chef for any reason. The newest species to join the aggregate is the Terran species known as humans. They have a drink known as soy sauce, which is highly sought after by Linmiads for special events. Dibiak Review of Ontological Species Studies, all about Linmiads, Salt of the Sea, published by Glass and Steel, all about Linmiads, Translation Engine 3.1415. Zoe darted through the door before it had opened all the way. Fubsy! Fubsy! Nerf was right behind her and saw Fubsy emerge from behind one of the lounges in the main room. Her fur stuck up straight from her body, making her look bigger. Her tail was whipping back and forth very quickly. Nerf didn't know anything about Terran cats, but Fubsy didn't look happy. When Fubsy saw it was them, she seemed to calm down. Her fur started settling down and her tail slowed down. She ran over to Zoe and made little chirping noises and dropped what she'd been carrying in her mouth. It was a torn piece of white fabric. Zoe looked up at Nerif. Call the captain, now. Nerif nodded and tapped on her bracelet. Liaison Nerif, calling for the captain. Priority urgent. The captain's voice emerged from the bracelet. Liaison Nerif, uh, is there an issue? Oh, you bet there is, Nerif said harshly. Get down here, now. Zoe looked at Nerif in surprise. Everyone looked at Nerif in surprise. Wow, Nerif, Alan said. Didn't know you had it in you. Someone did something to Fubsy, Nerif said. Her fury barely controlled. True enough, Alan said, and no one said anything more. In just a few minutes, the door rang and announced the captain. Nerif stalked to the door and opened it up. Someone was in our quarters without our permission, Nerif said, and someone distressed our cat. We take that very seriously. It's grounds for termination of the contract. You should take it seriously, too. Captain Rackham sat down on the edge of one of the loungers, which creaked a little under his weight. Most assuredly, lady, I do. Uh, what happened? After our breakfast, we went for a tour of the ship. When we came back, Dara paused and Zoe took over. When we came back, one of your crew members said he'd been looking for us. But if he'd been looking for us, he'd have used the sprite on the bracelet to find us, instead of coming to our quarters, wouldn't he? Zoe said, a bite sharp in her voice. He was leaving our quarters. I could tell he'd been in here. When we came in, Bubsy had this. Zoe tossed a scrap of white material on the captain's lap. I suggest, Nara said, picking up the narrative, that unless you want this contract terminated with penalties, you'll find that crew member now. She yelled that last word, and even the captain jumped at the volume. The captain tapped his bracelet. Give me the names of all the crew in this vicinity in the last half and an hour. In the last half an hour, the crew members near the quarters, MB-134R, Captain John Rackham, an electronic voice announced. The captain looked surprised. Expand the search, all crew members near these quarters for the past hour. In the past hour, the crew members near quarters, MB-134, are Captain John Rackham. 
Expand search. Anyone leaving level M corridor B for the past four hours, subtract the residents of MB-134 and Captain Rackham from the results, Captain said. Searching. No results found. Captain Rackham sat up straighter and turned to Nerif. I suggest we head back to my quarters, where my tools and resources are greater. We're not leaving Fabsy behind, Quero said. Of course not. That dear lady must come with us as well, the captain said. Adam took Fabizi's leash and clipped it in a harness. When they stepped outside their quarters, the captain was in the lead and the team was unconsciously forming a protective circle around Fabzi. Once in the captain's quarters, he headed over to his desk. Show the locations of everyone on non such level M corridor P and eight bells this morning. Dots appeared on the screen. Fast forward location tracking. Dots moved on the screen. The time appeared in the lower right of the corner. At 8.40, ship time. The dots on the team appeared on level MB. That's when we came back from breakfast, Tariff said. And uh, there we are, dropping off Bubsy, Nate said. Then we head out on our tour. We watched the hallway, but no other dots appeared. The dots for their team appeared at Nine Bells, stopped at South their quarters briefly, and then went into MB-134. Whoever it was that we met didn't have their bracelet on, Nate said, tapping the screen. Can we see if anyone pinged our location during this time period? Griff asked. I see where you're going with this, Alan said. If someone was trying to find out where we were, and they took the bracelet off, it would give us their identity. No pings pings requested requested during during time frame, frame. the electronic voice stated. Can you separate out all the trails? Griff asked. There were two trails on level M. Both of them were moving while the break was occurring. This meant that the bracelets hadn't been removed and tucked away in some place. Can you search for any bracelets not being worn? Joey asked. The captain sighed. I can, but regulations only require that they are worn during working hours. During non-working hours, a person's choice. At that time of day, 45% of the crew would be off duty. In any case, we already know that whoever broke into your quarters has a detailed plan in place. It requires them being off duty and you being away from your quarters. We don't know if Fubsy was a surprise for them or the target. Captain Rackin picked up a piece of cloth and examined it. I can't be sure, but it does look like this comes from one of our uniforms. I don't suppose there's any chance that we can track the uniform, Nerif asked. Captain Rackham shook his head. They're disposable. We wear them for a day, then recycle them and create a new one for the next day. Well, Nate said, a slight drawl in his voice. I reckon we know one more thing about our mysterious crewmate. What's that? Captain asked. You have a mole on board your ship, Nate said. And then he smiled. End of chapter. Anyways, on to the story. All about the Linmeads, part 7. Diving into Linmeads. Linnemeads are renowned in the aggregate for their ability to hold their breath underwater. Unlike the Goadels, they are not adverbious. Instead, they actually hold their breath. This system slows down in what is known as a dive reflex, where going under the water triggers a whole set of autonomic function changes. This is unknown in any other warm-blooded species. To be a review of ontological species studies, all about Linmeads, diving into Linmeads, published by Glass and Steel, all about Linmeads, translation engine 3.1415. Nerif turned from Nate's smile, a little worried about what she was saw lurking in there, and saw Zoe. Zoe had her head tilted to one side, thinking, First, we need to check Fabsy, or medical scan to see if she was hurt or tampered with in any way, Zoe said. Captain Rackham nodded. Oh, of course, I was about to suggest it myself. If Fabsy is fine, I am willing to continue with the contract for now. Our team will have to meet with and discuss how we all feel about that, Zoe said. How many weeks will that take, do you estimate? Captain Rackham asked. Weeks? Nara asked. I don't think it'll take weeks. She looked at the team. We'll be able to decide tonight, probably, don't you think? Everyone nodded their agreement. Rackham sighed. You must be able to reach a quick decision because you're not a mated group. Sometimes I envy other species. Yeah, well, so he said. To get back to our plan of attack, assuming Fubsy checks out, 
We need to see a list of all the male trolls working on your ship. In person or pictures, hopefully we'll be able to recognize him. Of course, Captain Racken said. In fact, I would request that you review the team for the perpetrator, even if Pubsy is, especially if Pubsy has been armed. Alan's eyes narrowed at the captain's last comment. If Pubsby has been harmed, there will be hell to pay. Nero didn't understand why paying a remittance to a mythological location for dead evildoers was in any way related to the topic. But based on the anger she could feel coming off of Alan, she knew it meant bad things for the troll that had broken into their cabin. Lastly, we need to give a class to your entire crew, alerting them at how dangerous Pubsy is, though he said. But uh, Pubsy is dangerous. Tariff pointed out. She will be, so he said. Captain Rackham personally escorted them to the medical quarters. You don't need to escort us, personally, Captain Rackham, Darif said. I'm sure you have other duties to attend to. We can use the sprites to find medical. Captain Rackham bowed to Nerf. Dear lady, most of my pressing duty on the ship at this moment is to make sure that I uphold the terms of our contract. Despite my own personal motivation to keep the contract, my honor and the honor of my crew have been damaged by this incident. Nerif opened her mouth to say something conciliatory, and then remembered how upset Fubsy had been when they went into the cabin and changed her mind. Quite right, Captain. We would think less of you and yours if you did any less. In the medical center, Captain Rackham's presence brought about immediate action. The person in charge of the medical center was another troll. Dr. Livesey, we need an immediate full scan on Fubsy. Captain Rackham, of course, sir. Do we need a cost-benefit analysis first? I've already done one. And which one of you is Fubsy? Dr. Livesey asked. This is Fubsy. Dr. Livesey looked down at the large kitten with some surprise, but reached out for her leash without an expression of fear. That's okay, doctor. Nerf said. I'll keep her leash. She knows me. And trusts me. Now then, the doctor said, would you please bring her over here to the main scanner? The doctor tugged her ear, looking at Fubsy. How can you get her up in the table? Nerf said, like this, and tapped the table. Come on, Fubsy. Fubsy jumped up on the table, and Nerf pet her and rubbed her forehead against Fubsy's face. After three attempts, the doctor was finally able to get a full scan of Fubsy. Zoe handed over her scans of Fubsy from when Fubsy was in quarantine. The doctor spent some time comparing the scans and finally said, I don't see any differences except in size. What were you expecting to see? Nerif could feel the team's relief with the doctor's pronouncement. Nate turned to the captain. Now the next step. Captain nodded and handed his compad over to Nate. Nate sorted for male trolls and looked through the images but shrugged and handed it to Alan. I didn't recognize him. Would you take a look? Alan looked through the pictures a little more slowly than Nate did. He finally shook his head. I don't see him either. The combat made the rounds to everyone, and they all agreed that the trial that they'd seen in the hallway wasn't present on the list of pictures. Maybe you made a mistake, the captain said delicately. Maybe the troll was female. Nate adjusted for female, and then quickly shook his head. No, definitely not. Is there anyone on this ship that's not part of your crew besides us? Tariff asked. The captain shook his head, and now his face looked dark and angry. No, uh, crew only. How could there be a stowaway on my ship? How would he get food? Someone on your crew must be helping him, Worf said. At least that explains why we couldn't find any anomalies in the bracelet scans. And I assume you don't have personal scans. The captain shook his head. Against aggregate laws, and worth more than my captain's license if I violate that after the, um... He stopped delicately, not completing his sentence. We can walk Fubsy around the ship, see if she can locate his smell. Do you think that she might react if she smelled him again? Nara asked. Alan shrugged. Who knows? Would be worth trying, though. First, however, I want to have that class with all the ship's crew, so he said. We have three ships, Captain Rackham said. You need to give three classes. No problem, so he said. Nate, Alan, I need your help with a couple of props I'll need for the class. Nero stood in front of approximately one-third of the crew. 
Zoe, Tara, Alan, Quirrell, and Nate stood on the stage next to her. Alan was holding Fubsy's leash. Fubsy was alternately curling around Alan's legs and then washing herself, pretending not to notice the crowd at all. Hello, everyone. My name is Nero. I am the liaison officer for the expedition crew that was hired for this voyage. Along with me are my nesters, Tariff and Quirif. The humans are Zoe, Nate, and Alan. She pointed at each person in turn. Finally, this is our cat, Bubsy. I'm sure you all are aware of the rules regarding humans and their pet. Bubsy is an especially dangerous predator, and Zoe is here to talk to you about your safety regarding any interactions with Bubsy. The crowd was attentive as Zoe walked up and narrow stepped back. Zoe had a metal bar in her hand. It's vitally important that you understand how dangerous Pubsy can be. She is young and seems very sweet, and to us she is, but here's why you should stay away from her, unless invited to interact with her. Alan. Alan led Pubsy forward and Zoe held the iron bar out. Come on, Pubsy, she said. Pubsy grabbed the bar from Zoe and started chewing on it. She dropped it to the ground with a clang and let the audience make an audible sound in reaction to her chewing of the bar. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Fubsy, Zoe said, and she bent over and picked up the metal bar. She then turned back to the audience, holding the bar in two hands, one on each end. As you can see, Fubsy is very strong. Zoe started to bend the bar. The strength is not a bad thing. Then she bent the bar further. However... When strength is paired with emotion, she bent the bar in half. Then it becomes extremely dangerous. Please don't invoke that kind of danger for yourselves or your crewmates. Thank you. Zoe left the stage and Narev stepped out. She could barely contain her shock, but knew that her team needed her to appear calm and confident. Thank you for your attention, Narev said as a dismissal, and she and the team headed back to their quarters. As soon as they were in their quarters, Nerev turned to the humans They were smiling broadly. How oh, did you do that? Nerev demanded. Nerev, Tate said, you've heard all about how strong humans are because we were raised on a high gravity world and our bones are strong and, uh, I want the truth, Nerev said. There is no way that Fubsy could chew an iron bar. So he laughed. It wasn't actually an iron bar, but it looked like one, didn't it? Nerev's face cleared. Ah, that's why you wanted Nate and Alan to help you build props for the class. Zoe smiled, but this had a little bite in it. I figured that even if we couldn't make people afraid of Fubsy, we might be able to make them afraid of us, based on the myths about humans that everyone knows. End of chapter. All about the Lineads, part 9. Sea of Language. Linmead idioms and sayings tend to center around fish in the sea, as one might imagine. Visitors start smelling like fish after three days, or don't let that crackle put her tentacles around you unless you're bigger than she is, or the ocean holds all the mysteries that a Linmead's lost. These sayings are of intense interest to the linguistics team of the Dross, but not really of interest to anyone else. They are only mentioned here, so the linguistics team will finally stop talking. Do a review of ontological species studies, all about Alinmead's Sea of Language, published by Glass and Steel, all about Alinmead's Translation Engine 3.1415. Each day, the non such would drop out of FTL. Two trolls would take a shuttle and land on the planet. The non such would reposition towards the next planet, re enter FTL, repeat, repeat. Repeat. Okay, that might have been a bit of an exaggeration, but it didn't feel like one. Nerev felt like beating her head against the table. They couldn't use their compads. They couldn't go for a walk. All they could do was eat and sleep. The feeling of being trapped grew every day, and Nerev could feel it pressing on her from all sides. As a liaison, she announced, I have a proposal. I suggest we play a game involving knives and alcohol. Wow, near a funny, Alan said. That's probably not the best idea. Well then, how about a game of truth and or embarrassing actions, she said. Nate broke into a smile, his first real smile in days, and said, Probably the safer option. Who starts? I will, 
Darif said. Zoe, truth or embarrassing action? Darif asked. Truth, Zoe said. If humans aren't psychic, how did you know that the troll in the hallway was up to something? Captain Rackham had been reading a collection of bound papers, stuck a finger in between the pages and looked up with interest. Zoe shrugged. Um, he acted guilty, she said. But what does that mean? Narif pressed. Well, Zoe thought for a minute. He twitched when he saw us coming, like he wanted to run away when he saw us, but then controlled it. Why would he want to run away? Because you were walking, Bubsy, a creature you've gone to some lengths to convince everyone is very dangerous, said Captain Rackham. His remarks might have been a bit more serious if the dangerous creature he spoke of hadn't been curled up on his lap, sleeping. Nate shook his head. That was after, but Zoe's right. That guy was acting guilty as anything. Zoe nodded. So, first he twitched, then he said that he was looking for us. He asked us one question, directed us to talk to someone else, and practically ran down the hallway to get away from us, or to make sure that he wasn't present when we opened the door. Plus, he said that he was looking for us, but on the ship, if you're looking for someone, you ask the spirits to guide you to them. Nerev looked at Zoe. You got that? Oh, from a twitch, a question, and a departure. Nah, Nate said. She got that all because she's human. Zoe looked around for something to throw at Nate, but he waved her off. It's not a space ox thing. Humans are just really good at reading body language. We can tell if someone is embarrassed or happy or sad or angry just from how they look. True, Zoe agreed. We're a social animal, so being able to read each other was vital to our survival. But you do it too. Nero shook her head. I can tell if one of my nesters is proud or angry by their feathers, but I can't tell if they're trying to hide something. It's just about seeing, Alan said. Look at our captain, for example. Everyone turned to look at Captain Rackham. In turn, he went back to reading his pages. Now tell me what you see, Adam directed Nerif. I see the captain reading bound pages and not paying attention to our game, Nerif said, after looking at the captain very carefully for a couple minutes. Not really, Adam said. He's pretending to read, and all the time you watched him, he hasn't moved his eyes past the same spot of the page. He hasn't turned a page, and now that we're talking about him, the tips of his ears are getting red. Well, redder. Ah, Querf said. He swung his legs down from the bunk and joined the team watching Captain Rackham pretend to read. Captain Rackham's ears did get even redder, and he ostentatiously turned the page. Now he turned the page, Tariff said. Does that mean that he's reading now? Nope, Nate said. If you asked him to tell you about what he is reading, he wouldn't be able to tell what he just read, unless he's read that book before, and just remembering from that. Interesting, Nara said. That's a book. Well, uh, what are the original things called books? Not like books today. Of course, it has the added benefit that you can read it even if you don't have access to your combat, added said. Nera focused her attention on the captain and propped her chin on top of her hands. So, Captain Rackham, truth or embarrassing action? I don't remember agreeing to play this game, Captain Rackham said. Too late, Dara assured him. According to the rules, you have to object when the first brought up. So, which shall it be? The captain marked his spot with his finger again. If he hadn't been trapped by Fubsy on his lap, Narif got the impression that he would have stood up and moved to the front of the cavern. She was thrilled at the idea that she was learning the human method of reading body language. The humans were really good teachers to teach her so well in just a few minutes. Captain Rackham sighed, putting Narif from her thoughts. Embarrassing action, as long as it doesn't involve disturbing our fair lady here. Narif narrowed her eyes at him. He was cheating, but did it well. Okay, she said. Read out loud from your book. The captain flipped to the front page and Nerif interrupted him. No, read from where you are now in the story. The captain coughed and turned even redder from his ears down to his neck. Well, um, you see, um, you picked embarrassing action, Nerif reminded him. Captain Rackham started reading that aloud from his book. The troll pirate princess started nibbling on the captive's neck. I know what you're doing, princess, the captain said. But I think pizza delivery man will be here soon, and unless you want him as our third. 
<laughs> You're reading porn, Zoe said in laughter and surprise. Oh, have you know that it is great literature, the captain said, and just then the deck shuddered as they dropped from an empty owl. Dark the nine, the captain muttered and dislodged Bubsy from his lap as he moved forward to the pilot's controls. Quarif, you're with me, everyone else, buckle up. The captain started flipping switches and opening the shuttle bay doors. Now we're never going to know if the pizza delivery man becomes their third, Tariff whispered, but just loud enough for the captain to hear him. Quiet, please, the captain ordered. We'll be making landfall in a few minutes, and then we're on our own until the nonsuch returns in a seven day. As they grew closer to the planet, the island shaped like a human symbol of a heart grew in the viewport. The sky lit up with a rainbow of distorted light as the nonsuch reoriented and took off for the next planet. Steve's Island, Nerf said, and she could feel the excitement from everyone around her without even using her new skills to read body language. I have one more question, Zoe, Nerf asked. How did you know that he was a male troll? What do you mean? Zoe asked. Well, it's easy to tell the females, Nerf said, but the males and the carriers look a lot alike. I wouldn't be able to tell them apart. So, how did you... There was a shocked silence from the seat next to her, and Nerf turned to look at Zoe. Bang me with a spoon, Zoe said. Didn't even think of her. I didn't know. End of chapter. All about the Linmeads, part 10. Water is dry. The Linmeads have an awfully dry sense of humor for a species that spends so much time in and around water. In fact, most members of the aggregate do not understand when the Linmeads are joking at all. In an effort to avoid damaging relations with trade partners, Linmeads do not call out or explain their jokes to other species. When a trade partner corrects a Linmead, the Linmead will only thank them for the detailed explanation. If it weren't for the Linmead former members of the Dross team, it's likely their sense of humor would never have been exposed to scientific study. Dubuque Review of Ontological Species Study All About Linmeads Water is Dry Published by Glass and Steel All About Linmeads Translation Engine 3.1415 So, when are we landing on Steve's Island? Captain Racken called back to the team. Do you know where exactly Steve died? Zoe asked. I do. You think there, then? The captain said. After start in the Isle of View, the next instruction says... To die will be an awfully big adventure, so, yeah. I think that's where we start, Zoe said. How many other people know where Steve died? Nareth asked. Good question. The captain flipped a couple switches and said, Only my mate group. We got the message from Steve asking us to take him home. But when we arrived, he was already dead. The map and the note addressed to me were all that were on him. The note said, I did it. And your mate group wouldn't share that information with anyone else, even accidentally, Zoe asked. Sure, and they wouldn't share that information on purpose, Captain Racken said. It would give no benefit to the group and would cost us dear. However, it's always possible that someone could be tricked into sharing that information. Our little subterfuge won't stand a chance if someone shared the information. But if they were only tricked, it's hopeful that this will still work. Hopeful. Alan said, that's one of my favorite words. Captain Rackham landed the ship and the bottom tip of the island as gently as Quirif could have done. He stood up and headed back into the cargo area of the shuttle and pulled out some expedition suits. We have suits to deal with the heat. They're fully charged, so they should at least last for ten days, and the nonsuch will be back before then, the captain said. Hopeful, and now should, Alan muttered, all of my favorite words in one spot. Zoe pulled his suit on. Stop grousing, Alan, she said. If they weren't your favorite words, you should never have joined the expedition team. I like grousing, Alan said, and I never wanted to be on the expedition team. I wanted to be a lumberjack. Ow, said Alan, rubbing his shin bone. What's wrong with being a lumberjack? Quirif asked Zoe, since she was now the one that had kicked Alan. Not a thing. But Alan likes misquoting Monty Python, and that's an unforgivable sin, so he said. Unforgivable sins cause the reflex action of me kicking him in the shin. Just one of those things, she said with a shrug and a smile. 
So, Monty Python is a holy man to humans, Quirrell said. Nate snickered. That about sums it up. Monty Python, Zoe declared, as she zipped up his suit, was the greatest comedy group to ever grace the human world and deserves our eternal irreverence. Ah, I understand, Quirf said. Humor is sacred to humans. Date finished putting his thermal harness on Fubsy and then zipped up his own suit. Things to watch out for, overeating large amphibious reptiles and rock slides, he said. And anything not caught by the first expedition team, so he added. Thanks, Mom and Dad, Adam said. We know the drill. Kurf whispered to Teref. Did you bring a drill? Teref nodded back. I've got you covered. They all stepped out of the shuttle and Captain Rackham sealed up behind them. Zoe looked at him curiously. Captain Rackham, you served on a number of expeditions, haven't you? She asked. I have, he agreed. When I became captain on my own ship to cut out the middleman. It felt like too much danger for not enough reward, because too much of the fee had to go to the ship that carried us. One of my mate group helps the Ray planets, so we know which planets we want for our expeditions, which ones have the greatest cost-benefit analysis for the group. Interesting, Zoe said. Maybe we should think about something like that for our group. Captain Rackham raised an eyebrow. I will take more than six of you to run a ship. As far as I can see, Quirif is the only one amongst you with flight experience. Alan spoke up. I've got a little. Not as much as Quirif, but some... Nate pulled out a map and looked at it again. This map shows a line starting at the bottom of the heart and heading straight up, about halfway up to the heart. There's another line. Give my regards to Broadway. Hopefully, we'll figure what that means when we get there. Nate looked up at the sky and then pointed out a direction. That way, I think. Think, Alan muttered. And there's another... Ow! He glared at Nate, who was looking innocently in a different direction. At least you two pick different shins, Alan said. You're welcome, Nate said. Image is on, and let's see how far we can get before we need to make camp. What is a Broadway? Tara asked. It is a place on Earth uh, famous for singing and dancing, Nate said. Not sure how that's going to turn into a clue for FTL treasure. The team, the captain, and the two bearer droids headed in the direction that Nate had pointed. This world had no magnetic north but they were using the rising and setting of the sun as their east and west and making them rest up as they went. Nate had point, with Alan and Quirf behind him. Terra, Fubsy, and Nerif were in the middle, the two droids trundling along behind them, and then Zoe and the captain. Zoe walked beside the captain for a little while and then said, Captain, when we were looking for the troll in our cabin, how come you never suggested we look for a carrier? Didn't I... Captain Rankin looked surprised. You said he, and I'm sure I figured you were looking at both males and carriers. I didn't actually check which options you all were looking at as my compad got passed around. Hmm, so he said. When we stop tonight, we can check my combat for the photos of carriers, he said. Finding that mole will be a relief of my mind. Did you download your entire ship roster to your compad? So he asked, surprised. No, but, uh, oh... Embarrassed. We can't connect to the non-such while she's in FTL, and even when she drops out in the next planet drop-off, if we contact her, the mole would undoubtedly be able to determine our position. Undoubtedly, Zoe agreed dryly. I'm not used to being the way from my ship, he said, as by way of explanation. Guys, Nate called out from a prompt, I think we've got our Broadway clue. Zoe and Captain Rackham picked up the pace and joined the team in front of the rift that split in front of the path that they were taking. One rift was narrow and would be extremely difficult to travel through. And the other rift... Oh, my sainted aunt, Zoe said. It's a broad way. Bubsy came up to her and rubbed her head against Zoe's knee. Zoe bent over and scratched behind Bubsy's ears. You know how I feel, don't you, girl? You feel my pain... Zoe said. End of chapter. On to the story. All about the Linmeads, part 8. Trust in me. Linmeads as a species fall fairly low on the Kegler scale of deceit and deception. This means that they are generally bad at detecting when someone is acting in a deceitful fashion. 
but also means that they are bad at acting in a deceptive fashion themselves. Lenviates are sought after as advisors, liaisons, and any time you need trusted employees, they make terrible leos. Dubiuk Review of Ontological Species Studies, all about the Lenmiads, trusted me. Published by Glass and Steel, all about the Lenmiads, translation engine 3.1415. The door rang and announced the captain. Nerif, as liaison, answered the door. Come in, captain, she said. That was quite an impressive demonstration, Captain Rackham said. Zoe tilted her head in acknowledgement, but didn't say anything. I might have wished to know that she was that dangerous before she came aboard, he said mildly. Nerif lifted a chin. Bubsy isn't dangerous when we're around. That's one reason why we were so upset that someone broke into our quarters. As you say, Captain Rackham said, nodding his agreement. Until after we are finding that mole, I'd suggest that she not be left alone again. You can be rest assured on that, Captain, Nate said. But I came to discuss one more thing, Captain Rackham said. I fear that I may not be popular with your team, but I must mention it. Then, when you have your discussion about keeping the contract or ending it, you'll have all the information on hand. My plan was to use multiple shuttles and multiple stops to foil whoever was using the tracer. But if we have a mole on board, they may be able to let the glint know exactly what planet we used for our real landing site. To avoid this, I would like to give the appearance of leaving on the first shuttle, and then staying hidden on the ship until we get to the correct stop. I trust my mate group, and they will help us with the deception. But it means almost a week of staying in one of the shuttles in the bay, where the quarters are not as nice as this one. Thank you, Nareth said. We will include this fact in our discussion tonight. After the captain left, Nerev sat down and Fubsy climbed into her lap. Well, end the contract or keep it, she asked. I vote keep it, Nate said. If we turn down this job, we're asking for the glint to get the FTL drive first and be allowed fully back into the aggregate. Just because they get the FTL drive doesn't mean they'll be able to figure out how it works. Especially if it was created by a human, Quirf said. He saw Nate's face and smiled. However, I vote with Nate. I don't want the glint to get their hands on it. Alan sighed. I would rather not be in the same space quadrant as the glint. I don't want them hearing my name or thinking about me or remembering me. He paused and then said, But it sounds like it's too late for that. Tariff said, Your past with the glint is not by war. But we are a team, and I'll have your back. Whatever I can do, I will do with you. I vote with Nate, Quirif, and Alan. Nerif looked at Zoe, who nodded. I guess it's settled then, Nerif said. I'll send a message to the captain later on tonight. I would hate for the poor man to know just how quickly our group was able to make a decision. Her smile was small but wicked and made the other team members laugh. Over the next two days, they gave classes to the other two ships, warning them about the dangers of Fubsy. They took Fubsy on walks, lots of walks, all over the ship, to every nook and cranny that they could find, and some that were just stumbled over. Fubsy seemed to enjoy the walks, but if she detected the troll that had broken into their quarters, she gave no sign. Unless pausing to wash herself was a sign. In what was hopefully good news, Bubsy's color didn't change either. She was still charcoal black, and in the right light you could see the stripes of pure black on her fur. She didn't get any lighter, and she didn't get any darker. On the third day, the non such dropped out of FTL with a distinctive quiver that you could feel through the floor. The team had packed their bags in preparation, and the door rang announcing Rogers. Captain's compliments, and he asks that you join him in the shuttle bay for the planet drop, Rogers said smartly, her hand to her head in what Nareth remembered was a salute. Rogers, Nate said, are you a member of the captain's family group? Yes, so, Rogers agreed. Dr. Livesey will be giving you a pre-flight physical exam. Rogers paused and then said, Dr. Livesey is also a member of the captain's family. Rogers escorted them down to the shuttle bay, which had nine shuttles in it. The first officer was there to receive the last instructions from Captain Rackham. 
and Dr. Rackham and Dr. Livesey scanned them and pronounced them fit to leave. After the first officer and Dr. Livesey left, two more trial entered the bay and climbed aboard the shuttle. Give me your bracelets, the captain said, and held out his hands. After a moment of confusion, Quirrell's face cleared and he handed over his bracelet and took Fubsy's bracelet off of her harness. You're taking the bracelets down to the surface so that no one can track us here. So, then it looks like we went down with the shuttle, Quirrell said with a smile. The captain tapped the side of his nose with his finger and pointed at Quirrell. Everyone else handed over the bracelets and the captain added his to the pile that he handed to two trolls that were to fly the shuttle planet side. He pulled one into an embrace, his hand on the back of their neck, and they touched foreheads. Luck be with you, he said. We don't need luck, John. You should know that by now, the female of the two said with a smile. The team and the captain climbed into shuttle four, while the two trolls headed off in shuttle one. Once the first shuttle left, Captain Rackham looked around the shuttle that would be their home for the next few days and said, not as nice a welcome as I'd hoped to give you, but uh, I'm glad you decided not to end the contract. Nate was looking at the viewport towards the bay doors. What were their names? The two on the shuttle, Captain Rackham asked. They nodded, not taking his eyes off the doors. Ben and Alex, the captain said. He smiled almost apologetically. We all love the old pirate stories of your world and have broken with tradition a little. Tradition says that we should take our names from our own mythology, but as a group, we decided to take our names from yours. A group decision, huh? Alan said. How many weeks did it take for you to decide? The captain smiled again. Almost no time at all. It was our love for those stories that brought us together. Nate continued to stare out the viewport. What happens if the glint find them? He asked. Nothing, the captain said. Nothing at all. The glint wouldn't dare. They would be cast out from the aggregate completely. Nate snorted. I never thought you were as naive, Captain. The nonsuch shifted position, pointing to the next planet and then entering FTL. Nate continued to stare out the viewport. I hope you're right. I really do. End of chapter. All about the Linmeards, part 11. The Crackmore. Linmeads have few predators on their homeworld. The biggest and most aggressive predator is the crackball. This amphibious reptile is one and a half to two meters in length. It is an opportunistic predator and rarely attacks adults, but has been known to kill and eat children. The skin of the crackball is covered in a sonic absorbing slime that makes it difficult for Linmeads to detect while in the water. It favors lurking in dark places and then darting out and grabbing an unsuspecting Linmead. While attacks on adults are rare, it is capable of removing a limb from an adult. Crackmore have also been known to attack on land. While other species might use a creature like the Crackmore to frighten their children into good behavior, the Linmeads do not. They are quite earnest in making sure their children understand the dangers of the Crackmore and how to fight it if they are attacked. Dubuque Review of Ontological Species Studies. All About the Linmeads, The Crackball, published by Glass and Steel. All About the Linmeads, Translation Engine 3.1415. The thing I'm worried about, said Nate as he studied the map, is that there are clues all over the map, and I'm assuming he put false clues so people wouldn't just skip all the middle part and jump right to the end of the hunt. But I'm also not confident they were going the right way. It seems pretty clear, Quirif said. But you can put a question mark on the map. If we're wrong, we'll start over at this point. Fair enough, Nate said, and licked the pencil tip before marking the map. They turned to stare down at the wide ravine. Going down that ravine felt like a trap. Have you ever read Kipling? Alan asked. I have, Captain Rackham said. Me too, so he said. Does this remind you of where Mowgli killed Shere Khan? Alan asked. The ravine where they made the cattle stampede. Zoe shook her head. I really wish you hadn't brought that up. We can't let the walls scare us off, right? Nate said. We'll just have to keep our senses alert and our minds on the job at hand. I've got point again. He started down the ravine, and they followed in their established order. As they walked down the ravine, it slowly descended, and the walls steadily grew higher. There were a few bends, 
so travel was slow as Nate checked them out. He also tried an experimental jump to see if he could jump high enough to get out of the ravine, but couldn't quite make it to the top. Of course, that's when they heard the hiss from behind them. Zoe froze and called quietly but urgently to Nate, We've got trouble. Nate halted the group. Something's following us, Zoe said. Give me one of the droids. The team moved aside so Zoe could access one of the droids. She attached her compad to it and turned on the camera. Alan gave her a thumbs up and let her know that she was receiving the local feed from her compad and then started directing the droid back down the ravine the way they had come. Once the droid disappeared around the bend in the ravine, everyone gathered around Alan's compad to see what the droid saw. Terror of the deep, Nara whispered as the image appeared on the screen. Captain, since we are on a retrieval mission, rather than an exploratory mission, are we legally clear just to kill that thing? What is it? Alan asked, and Nerev pretended not to notice that Nate had thumbed the power level up on his weapon. If it attacked the group, they were within their rights to get it, no matter what kind of expedition that they were on. It's a crack more, Nerev said, glancing away from the screen to look at Alan. At his blank look, she explained further. A creature from the deep on our world. It slips through the water without detection and steals children. It can come up on the land and will attack anything that it finds. Nerif, Alan said, we're not on your world. That isn't a crackmore. It looks like a crackmore. It sounds like a crackmore. It is a crackmore, Nerif said stubbornly. Look, Nate said, though his weapon, like Zoe's and Captain Rackham's, was still drawn. We knew that there were large amphibious reptiles on this world before we landed. It's a little further inland than I would expect, but we can take it out. It will not attack us. It wants something easy and familiar, not tough and strange. Unless it's mating season, Zoe said. Have you ever seen a video of a tortoise chasing away humans during mating season? Good point, Nate said. Just how big do you think that thing is anyway? They looked at the reptile on the screen. Bigger than I would want to meet. Alan said. I'm going to recall the droid, and I suggest we start moving. Captain Rackham nodded. I think moving is a good idea. Let's not wait for that droid. And if it starts following the droid, abandon the droid. The reptile seemed to have no interest in the droid, and didn't follow it. So much as just happened to be heading down the same ravine as the droid. When Alan cranked the speed up on the droid, the reptile didn't change its pace, moving steadily forward like a clockwork machine. The team started moving out, and when the droid caught up, Zoe retrieved a compad. She and the captain kept rear guard, in case the reptile picked up pace. Nate, Zoe called out, keep an eye out for some way out of this. We're going to want to find a place to make camp. I'm on it, Nate said. I'm just having a little trouble finding a good spot. Do you think that reptile can climb? Captain Rackham said, the previous expedition didn't say anything about climbing. Why? I think we can get up and on top of the ravine. I don't think it's a good plan to camp down here. This ravine looks like it's been created by water rather than tectonics. Theoretically, the tent could keep a flash flood off of us, but I really don't want to test that. Now on top of the ravine sounds like a good plan, Captain Rackham said, but you couldn't jump out before. How do you plan on getting out now? There's a ledge up here. I think we can get everyone out in two stages, Nate said. Captain Rackham took his eyes off the path behind him and glanced at the ledge Nate was talking about. Leapfrogging our way up? Zoe asked. Yeah, I think so, Nate said. He holstered his weapon and jumped up to the ledge, kicking his feet out on the way up and grabbing on the ledge with his fingers and then pulling himself up. He jumped up and down experimentally a couple of times and then jumped back down into the ravine. Okay, the ledge seems strong enough. There's enough room for two people, or one person and one droid, or one troll and a fubsy, Nate said. Everyone put on climbing gear, Nate said. I'll watch it at the top and we'll bring everyone up. Kurov popped open the barrier droids and handed out the climbing gear to everyone. I'll carry fubsy, the captain offered, but Zoe shook her head. She might be scared and she doesn't know you too well. She might hurt you. You take on one of the droids, you're strong enough. Alan, you take fubsy, I'll take the other droid. Nate jumped to the ledge and then to the top of the ravine. In his hands, he held the ropes that were attached to the climbing harnesses of each team member. He anchored the ropes at the top and said, Let's go! 
He pulled Nerif and Quirif to the ledge, and then pulled Terif up to the top of the ravine. Once Terif was up, together they pulled up Nerif. Alan had Fubsy slung over his shoulder. Don't scratch the face, girl, he told her. Anywhere but the face. And then he started climbing up the line of the ledge. She struggled a little bit, but once they were up to the cliff face, she froze, as if to avoid falling. Quirif, you're next. Nate called down with a quiet intensity that showed that he was still mindful that shout might draw the attention of the reptile. Alan, do you think you can jump up here? Alan looked at the top doubtfully. I'd be willing to try if my arms weren't full of anxious fubsy. Nate looked down at the ravine and swore. I don't want to kill indigenous life if I don't have to, he said, but it's coming our way. Nate, Terif, and Nerif started hauling Quirif up. As soon as he was at the, the ledge, Zoe turned to the captain. Leave the droid, climb up to the edge. The captain set the droid down and started up his rope. Zoe took a rope off and tied it around both droids as a package bundle. The hiss was louder now and Nerif could see it coming around the last bend. Zoe, Nerif called, not caring that the crackmore could hear her or not. It's coming, jump! Zoe jumped to the ledge more easily than Nate had, then turned and started hauling up the captain. Once Quirif had reached the top, they started pulling Alan and Fubsy up. The crackmaw, Nerif thought, was larger than any crackmaw that she had right to be. This one was easily three times the length of Captain Rackham, and having caught sight of the movement on the ravine wall, was drawn in to investigate. Hurry! Hurry! Nerif shouted. Up you go, Captain! Zoe said through gritted teeth. She'd wrapped his rope around her right arm and pulled. The captain found himself face down on the ledge, one arm hanging over the side. He quickly pulled it up, and as he realized the reptile might be able to grab a hold of his arm. Alan and Fubsy were finally on top, and the team, except for Nate, started pulling Captain Rackham up. Nate grabbed Zoe's rope to pull her up, and ended up with two droids. Zoe jumped the last bit to the top and laughed, a shaky laugh. To ask your question, Nerif. Captain Rackham said, because this is a retrieval expedition rather than an exploratory expedition, we have contractual right to kill anything we feel threatened by, even if it has not demonstrated a lethal intent to us. There is only one problem with that, Captain, Nate said. And what would that be? Captain Rackham said. The weapons don't work. End of chapter. All about the Linmiots, part 12. Sea Art. Linmead art is, like many aspects of their lives, ruled by the tide. For this reason, artwork was traditionally created on the beaches and wiped away with the tide. As time progressed, artwork was created in locations other than beaches. But it still wiped away with the tide, as calculated for the local area. The art styles are based on a range of seashells and sonar sound etching on the sand. If you ever have a chance to visit the Linmi at Homeworld, make sure to visit the during the summer art festival to view these works of art before the tide washes them away. Dubiuk Review of Ontological Species Studies All About the Linmiads Sea Art Published by Glass and Steel All About the Linmiads Translation Engine 3.1415 What the frack? Alan drew his weapon and aimed it at the wall across from the reptile. He pulled the trigger and nothing happened. Zoe pulled her weapon from her thigh holster and aimed near the reptile that was snuffling about where they'd gone up the wall. She pulled the trigger, and there was only a click. She fired a second time, and the gun only whined. Zoe swore, and even Captain Rackham took a step back at the rage in her voice. She paused and looked at him. How about you? Captain Rackham didn't lean over the edge to see the reptile, but only pointed his weapon at the opposite wall, as Alan had done. Unlike the humans, Captain Rackham's weapon was made to look like a period piece from the 1800s Earth, but only had one barrel, which meant that he only fired modern rounds. He pulled the trigger, and his gun whined, and a piece of the opposing cliff broke off and fell to the ground, scaring the crackmore wannabe off back down the way to come. Nerf watched as it ran away, but seemed to move faster than the crackmores at home. The team quickly set upon their tent, inner and outer, once inside the safety of the tent, Terev started unpacking his kitchen to prep for dinner, and the humans started inspecting their weapons. I am really hating that mole right now, Zoe said. When he broke into our cabin, he must have done it to sabotage our weapons, which doesn't make a lot of sense when you think about it. Why not? 
Well, generally speaking, a mole loses their value once they've been discovered. The only reason we even know a mole exists is because we caught him coming from our room. Why risk it? Just to sabotage our weapons. And why only ours? You three still have your blades, and the captain has his gun. So, it's not like we're unarmed and helpless. Zoe listed her questions on her fingers. Alan held out his hand for Zoe's gun, and she handed it over to him after checking to make sure that it was unloaded. Plus, sir, if we hadn't seen the mole, we wouldn't have had to be hiding for a week. We would have been prepping for this mission, Nate put in. We would have tested our guns and found out of this earlier, and still been alerted to the mole on the ship. Us? Yeah, we're not unarmed anymore, Terra broke into the conversation. He handed out three of his chef knives, one to each. Tariff, your new knives, Nate said. He accepted the knife and dipped his head to Tariff. Thank you. Bubsy rubbed her head against Tariff's knee and he bent over and gave her some pets, just the way she liked. It's not a big sacrifice, Tariff said. A little uncomfortable. I mean, our lives versus good food. He paused and smiled. Okay, maybe it's a big sacrifice, but it is worthwhile sacrifice. The humans and the roofs laughed, though Captain Rackham paused for a second as though he didn't realize that Tariff had been joking. Afterwards, Alan said, What really pisses me off is how easy this would be to fix on the ship. I've been checking the weapons, and basically, there's just a little piece of wedge between the hammer and the actuator. I could drill it out in just a few seconds on the ship. Here, it will take much longer to jerry-rig a fix. Or, Tariff said, you could use my drill. Tariff pulled out a drill from his kitchen equipment. You really brought a drill? Quirif said, surprised. I thought you were joking. Why do you even have a drill? Zoe demanded. Because, Tariff said, when I'm working with bones and bone marrow. Zoe held up a hand. Nope, never mind. Sorry, I asked. You're a chef, and you have a drill for reasons. I have a blowtorch, too, Tariff said meekly. I am not surprised, Nate said. As promised, Alan had the three guns repaired in minutes. But it was repairable, even if Tariff hadn't brought the drill, Zoe said. Yeah, I might have taken a day, though. The hardest part would have been assembling the drill that would operate fast enough to do any good, Adit said. So, either the mole didn't know what he was doing, or he only wanted us to be out of the picture for a day, Zoe mused. Maybe the captain's weapon wasn't touched because he didn't know the captain was going. Or maybe he wanted us to be inconvenienced, but not killed, Adam put in. Well, I'm surely inconvenienced, Date said. When they started setting up watches for the night, Nerev noticed that Zoe looked at Nate and then flicked her eyes at Captain Rackham. Nate did not exactly, but looking at him, Nerev knew just that he agreed to what Zoe had said. When Nate volunteered to keep the same watch and stand as Captain Rackham so they could talk pirates in private, Nerev wasn't surprised. She made her way to bed and tried to watch Captain Rackham. Psychic or not, Something about the captain had pinged Zoe, and Nate had agreed. Bubsy beeped and climbed on top of Nerev. Bubsy, you're too big to lie on me, Nerev protested. She moved Bubsy next to her and petted the kitten. Here, yeah, it's much better. Just petting Bubsy helped Nerev calm down from the day, and she fell asleep much faster than she thought she could. In the morning, there was no sign of the foe Crackmore, as Nate called it. They ate breakfast while trying to decide if they were going to drop back down into the ravine, or try and walk along the edge for as long as they could. In the ravine, we're trapped, and there's the foe Crackmore, Zoe said, but we might see the next thing on the map and not be able to see it from the lip of the ravine. Walking on the lip of the ravine, we'll have to carry the droids. They're all terrain droids, but I don't think that is what their designers had in mind, Captain Rackham said. We can't count on the convenient ledge the next time we need to get out of the ravine, Nerev said. What's the next clue on the map? Quirif asked. Nate looked at it and said, Have a good trip. Of course, that's a clue if we're actually going to the right way. In the end, they decided on walking along the lip of the ravine for as long as they could and let the droids walk whenever possible. They hadn't gone more than twenty minutes before they looked at a series of rifts that made up their path impossible. Well, um, the ravine it is, Nate said. Zoe and Captain Rackham repelled down first. Then the droids were lowered down, then Quirif and Nerf repelled down. 
Alan and Fubsy went next. Though Fubsy seemed to know what was coming and wailed piteously all the way down. Tariff was last to repel down. Nate unhitched the anchor ropes and tossed them down to where Quirif started putting them away. Nate climbed down partway and then just jumped the rest. Nailed it, Zoe said when Nate landed. Gotta love low-gravity worlds, Nate said with a laugh. As they headed down the ravine, Nerev kept glancing back, checking to see the crackmore was heading towards them. This time, the strange sound came from in front of them. Nate held out his compad to peek around the bend and started laughing. Zoe, you're gonna love this one, Nate called back. He started forward, and the team rounded the bend to see what was making the strange roaring noise. See you next fall, Zoe said through gritted teeth. Nate smiled happily. This is possibly the most beautiful waterfall I've ever seen, he said, and leaned against the ravine wall, his arms crossed. Don't you agree, Zoe? End of story. All about the Linmeards, part 13. Chasing waterfalls. Linmeards and goatles are the only species in the aggregate that are considered aquatic-based. The Linmeards still hold strong to their older traditions when on their homeworld. They are aquatic nomads and practice a sea-based hunter-gathering lifestyle, which easily provides them with all the nutrition that they need. This leaves a lot of leisure time, which they spend singing, creating art, and swimming. They are the only warm-blooded species in the aggregate that is born knowing how to swim. There are pictures of human babies swimming in water, but these are obviously works of fiction. We will be dispelling more myths about this newest species to join the aggregate in our upcoming book, The Care and Feeding of Humans. Nubiak Review of Ontological Species Studies, All About the Linmeards, Chasing Waterfalls, published by Glass and Steel, All About the Linmeards, Translation Engine 3.1415. Nerif looked at the waterfall. At least we know why the crackball was headed this way, she said. They looked up surprised and pulled himself away from the wall. I guess that makes sense. He seemed like he was far away from the water, but really, his home ground was here. So, what's the next stop on the map? We don't want to be here when he comes home, Nero said, and edged a little closer to the ravine wall. Nate spread the map out over the body of one of the droids, so everyone could see it. We're here, where it says, have a good trip, Nate said. But this map has these quotes scattered all over the place, and lines that look like Steve let a toddler scribble on his map. We've been following this line, but if you keep following it, it curves back and joins the starting line again. In fact, they all do. If we stay on this line to the next stop, it says, By the sea, by the sea. I'm not sure what this pun is for, but we didn't get the island's name until we saw it. Nate showed them the next stop of the map. Quirif measured the distance with his hands. That's about four or five days' journey, he said. Through what looks to be a pretty tough terrain, Zoe agreed. We'll be closer to the shuttle, though, Captain Rackham pointed out. We've been walking into the center, but this leads us back to the shoreline. Do you think we'll be able to get back before the ship comes to pick up the shuttle? Tariff asked Captain Rackham. He chewed on his bottom lip, thoughtfully. It'll be a close call, for sure, though it's not like they're only going to wait for a few minutes... It is my ship, after all. Nerif looked at the waterfall thoughtfully. The water was pouring down over one edge of the ravine and flowing further down the ravine in a small river. Evidently, attracted by the source of water, there was a large amount of vegetation in the area. Giant segmented reeds grew in a thick clump near the pool that formed at the base of the waterfall. Instead of days walking through the rough terrain, Nerif said, what would you think about creating a raft to float down the river? That's freaking genius, Nate said, and he patted her on her back as he trotted over to the reeds. Or, Alan pointed out, it could be a really horrific idea where we are trapped on a small raft in the middle of a river with a giant lizard chasing us in the water. Nerev's eyes glinted hard in the light. That's exactly where we want to be, trust me. Quirif had the most experience building rafts, and Nerif and Tariff had the most experience arguing with him about his ideas. Captain Rackham donated some of his climbing rope to lash the large reeds together, and Quirif insisted on using two of the largest reeds as pontoons on the bottom of the raft. So, um, Quirif really loves his rafts, 
Zoe said to Nerif as Quirif was loudly explaining to Nate why the knots needed to be tied in a certain way. On our world, we build a lot of rafts as children, Nerif said. We build a lot of forts as kids, Zoe said. Pillow forts, blanket forts, snow forts. Oh, no, Nerif said earnestly. Our lives depend on them. We can swim from birth, but we don't have the speed necessary to avoid predators. We use rafts to get around from island to island until we're big enough to deal with the predators. We also use them for fishing so that we can collect enough food without attracting predators or scavengers. We use them for housing and for storage. Nerif was working on several long, thin reeds while she was talking to Zoe. She was splitting one end down to the first segment in the reed. Bubsy was uh, helping by grabbing the waving ends. What are you doing with that bamboo? Zoe asked. Bamboo? Is that what you call it? Nerif asked. On our world, we use reeds like this for all sorts of things, including fishing spears. I figure we should have some on hand in case the crack maul comes back. Zoe sat down next to Nerif and grabbed one of the reeds and started splitting them with her and giving her a second target of attack for Fubsy. Nate evidently wanted to make a pirate flag for the raft, but was thwarted by the lack of materials. Captain Rackham was on guard, but was also, no surprise, in favor of a pirate flag and offering suggestions over his shoulder. Nerif spoke quietly to Zoe. Have you ever wondered why there are only three of us, Nestors? Zoe shook her head. I didn't know three was a small number. I haven't worked with a lot of Lindmeads before. Normally, Nero said, there are six or eight of us in a nest. There were seven of us in my nest. A crackmore ate four of our nest. She paused a moment, cutting the bamboo viciously. I hate them. I almost hope it attacks us. Zoe put down her bamboo and looked at Nero with full attention. You aren't facing this one alone, will you? And this faux crackball won't take any of us. Nero set down her own bamboo and leaned over and hugged Zoe. We have each other's backs. I know it. I feel it through my whole being. The raft is ready when you are, Nate called. Alan and Nate had helped Teref and Quirif push the raft down to the water. Quirif loves building rafts, Nero said to Zoe. He was too young to remember that night, but I think he remembers something. He's always building bigger and bigger rafts. This one is pretty big, Zoe agreed. The droids were already on the raft when Zoe and Nerif gathered up the bamboo and moved to the raft. Bubsy followed without any encouragement. She hesitated at the water's edge for a moment and then jumped over the water and onto the raft. Once everyone was on board, Quirif shoved the raft out from the flow of the river. Come on, everybody, here we go, he shouted as they started down the river. End of chapter. All about the Linmeads, part 14, Surf and Tide. Linmeads love to play games. Her favorite game is called Surf and Tide and is played on a green and white checkered board of 12 by 12 squares. There are 24 pieces on each side, one green and one white, to match the board. Each piece has its own moving pattern, and the various complex rules of the game are an indicator that the Linmeads are amongst the most intelligent creatures in the aggregate. Dubuque Review of Ontological Species Studies, all about Linmeads, Surf and Tide, published by Glass and Steel, all about the Linmeads, Translation Engine 3.1415. The raft floated well and behaved itself as it moved on the water. Gorov was not only the best raft designer of the group, but he actually understood how to guide it down the river. Once they drifted far enough away from the waterfall, the water calmed and became a smooth, flowing pathway. The river had an earthy smell to it, like a smell of water on the rocks on a hot day. The trees and reeds that surrounded the water had their own smell of rich green, but it was the smell of wet rocks that drew Nerf's attention. Nerf stood guard at the rear of the raft, she held one of the fishing spears that she had made. She held it loosely in one hand, while her eyes scanned the river, looking for any sign of the crack maw. Nerif was doing the same up front, but Nerif knew the foe or not, the crack maw was most likely to attack them from behind and under the water. The rest of the team were stationed around the edge of the raft, just in case. Bubsy didn't care about the smell or the crack maw. 
She had walked to the edge of the raft to drink some water, and she moved back to the middle where Quirif was piloting the raft. First, she leaned against him and then finally fell asleep, her chin resting on his foot. After many hours, Terif sniffed in the air. I smell the ocean, he called out. Nate took a long sniff and said, I do too. He pulled up a map and said, pretty soon we should be at the next clue, probably just over those bluffs. He pointed to where some sand dunes were laced with green weeds, with the sound of a soft surf behind them. And something bumped the bottom of the raft. Nerf swore. She'd taken her eyes off the water for just an instant, distracted by the talk of the ocean. There was another bump, a little bigger than the last one. Nerf was pleased to note that Quirf was still piloting, though he'd picked up the spear with his other hand. Tariff was poised to throw his spear in the foe crack more became visible. Nerif herself was holding her spear, ready to throw. Quirif was steering the raft towards the left shore. The raft shattered again with another bump, this one bigger than the last. The ropes that bound the bamboo still held, but a couple of smaller bamboos splintered under the impact of something underneath. Nerif shifted her spear in her hand, rotating it a little for the best grip. When the long, dark shape slid out of the underneath the raft, deep and near the bottom of the river, she threw her spear with all of her strength and wished just for a moment that she was as strong as Zoe. Zoe and the rest of the team had fired their weapons into the water, but Nerif could see at a glance that they hadn't accounted for the way the water bends light. She picked up another of her spears and stood, waiting for another shot at the crankmore. There was another bump, but this one was caused by the raft bumping on the shoreline. Off! 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 Nerf trotted everyone off. She was still watching the water intently. Unlike the shore of the beach, the river stayed fairly deep, even at the edge. A dark shape flickered in the deep water and then lunged up through the water to attack the craft. Nerf screamed. In another life, her scream might have been one of fear. Here and now, as she faced the crackmore, her scream was primal and defiant. She leaned back and threw the spear with every bit of her being. Her muscles, her blood, her heart were all poured into the spear. Then she threw at the crackmore as it broke the surface of the water. Pieces of the river raft still in its mouth. Her spear plunged deep into the eye of the crackmore, and that alone would have killed it. But as she backed away and it dropped down back into the river, two more spears appeared in the body of the crackmore and a volley of shots echoed past her and found their home in the body of the crackmore. River monster, Nerif reminded herself. She was shaking, and Zoe came up to her and pulled her away from the shore. Nerif, answer me, are you okay? It was Zoe's voice, and from the level of volume, it probably wasn't the first time Zoe had asked. I'm okay, Nerif said, her teeth chattering. I, uh, I've n- never felt like this b- before. It's probably just the adrenaline, so he said. Here, sit down. Over here. Wear this blanket. It'll help. Are you, are you sh- sure? Nerif asked. Her chattering grew worse. I am, so he said calmly while looking at Nerif. If it's one thing humans know how to deal with, it's a shock and its aftermath. Alan walked up to Nerif and so he headed for Tariff. Well, Nerif, Alan said, I've never heard anyone yell like that. I think we found the ship, Nate yelled at them from the top of the dunes. Okay, Adam said, maybe I've heard one person yell like that. Everyone in the team, including Fubsy, headed up to the top of the dune. It was a pretty standard short-haul ship, but the cone for the FTL drive wasn't located at the bottom of the ship. It was on the nose of the ship. Captain Rackham held his compad up in the air and searched for a connection. He didn't make a whooping noise when the compad connected to the ship. He ran his hands over the compad, and the door turned and indicated a light to green and slid open. That's when he made the whooping noise. Anyone care to join me on Steve's ship? Captain Rackham asked. They all moved to the ship, though Captain Rackham was inside first. That's when he whooped a second time. I found the FTL drive, he called back to the team, but I'll need some help getting it out. Quirif and Alan stepped up their pace, so they were the second and third into the ship. Terif and Nate were the next ones to go in. Finally, Zoe and Nerif headed to the door. Nerif paused, one hand on Zoe's arm, before they went into Steve's ship. Zoe, lend me its 
Don't have adrenaline, Nerf said. End of chapter. All about the Linmians, part 15. By the beautiful sea. Linmians have a fascination for other cultures. This fascination and respect is part of why the Linmians are such a successful traders. There's also something that Glint could learn in their interactions with other cultures. Um, they learned this technique from the Glint. Dubuque Review of Ontological Species Studies, all about the Linmians, by the Beautiful Sea, published by Glass and Steel. All about the Linmians, translation engine 3.1415. Zoe glanced at Nero's face and shrugged. Sorry, uh, adrenaline is a human name. What do you call it? Nero shook her head. No. You don't understand. We don't have an adrenaline analog. That is why when the glint... Nerf paused delicately and then bent to peck Bubsy, to avoid looking at the naked expression on Zoe's face. Anyway, Linmiads were never a market for that, Nerf said. We like to think that we were too noble to take that drug. But I wonder, if we had been able to use it, would we have been as noble... Zoe took a deep breath. Well, um, something happened to you. It looked like adrenaline. When Linmiads are faced with stress, what do you do? You don't freeze, right? No, Nerf agreed. We run, or fight, or whatever. But we never get that chemical boost that humans do. Fear doesn't make us run faster. It just makes us run. So, Zoe pressed, when you attacked the foe Crapmore, what did you feel? Have you ever felt that before? Because, I have to tell you, Nerif, that looked a lot like a classic fight-or-flight response. Nerif shook her head wordlessly. You've never felt that before, Zoe said. No, Nerif said. She paused a long time and then said, It was scary. Scary because I felt powerful. Scary because I would like to feel that again. Zoe laughed. Some of it was false, but most of it was real. Don't become a thrill junkie on us, Nerif. You're all the stable one. Nerif smiled. It was a small smile, but it was 100% authentic. I don't think there's any danger of me becoming a thrill junkie. Now, shall we go into the strange experimental ship for an unknown FTL device that may or may not have the glint on our tail? Zoe snorted a laughter this time, and it was genuine. I guess the idea of becoming a thrill junkie is kind of pointless when this is the life we're leading, right? Bubsy stood on her hind legs and stretched her paws up to Zoe as far as they would go. She could reach past Zoe's waist. Come on, you silly girl, Zoe said and picked her up. Let's go look at the ship. The interior of the ship was pretty much what Nero had expected, though perhaps a bit more cluttered. It hadn't crashed precisely. More like just had a hard landing. But that didn't account for the clothes tossed in a variety of places, or the empty food containers that just dropped anywhere handy. There was one that was overturned on top of the ship's microphone. Zoe picked up one of the empty food containers as Bubsy started expressing an interest in it. I wonder how long he stayed here before heading out to the point. He'd sent a message to be picked up. Why not just stay with the ship? It would offer shelter, at the very least. I'm guessing I know why, said Nate from the engine room. Zoe, Nero, and Fubsy headed over to see what Nate was talking about. There was a gap in one of the control panels, and wires showed where something had been unplugged. Oh, that's the ship's beacon, Zoe said. So he pulled it so the ship couldn't be tracked. Did Captain Rackham mention if they found Steve's body because of a tracking beacon? Captain Rackham changes his story just a bit every time we ask about it, Nate said. I didn't even bother to ask him this time. So he moved the tracking beacon, Nara said. But anyone that came to find him would be able to scan this island at least and find the ship. Not so, Captain Rackham said from behind them. Believe me, I scanned for the ship. I got a lot of false positives in this search because the rocks have high mineral content. But I never found the ship. Now, I could use some help getting the FTL drive unhitched. We saved four days by traveling down the river. Captain Rackham tipped his hat at your narrow. My thanks, my lady, he said as an aside. But we still have to lug this thing back to the shuttle before the nonsuch comes back to get us. 
Krell and Al were already arguing about the best way to detach the FTL drive from the ship and whether or not the cone on the front of the ship was integral to the design. Tara volunteered to go outside and get some scans of the cone. Nate walked over to the FTL drive, picked up one of the tools sitting next to the drive and gave it a smart rap with a wrench. It made an unmusical gong noise, but it did break through to Quirf and Alan's argument. Boys, boys, stop arguing, Nate said, and twirled the wrench. You're clearly removed like this. And he started working at the bottom of the drive, where it was bolted to the floor. Quirf and Alan gave each other a shameful look, and then grabbed wrenches of their own and joined Nate. It wasn't an argument, Alan finally said. We were just having a passionate discussion. Alan, if that's what you think a passion is, you need to spend some more time finding friends when we next hit Planet Fall, Nate advised. Alan blushed, but smiled and didn't argue with Nate. There's something very weird with the cone, Tariff announced when he came back into the ship after a few minutes. I can't get a focus on it, much less scan it. Captain Racken pursed his lips, it thought. Leave it, he said. We have the FTL drive. If it turns out that we need that cone, we can come back. But the drive and the cone will be too much for us to manage if we try to haul them both out at the same time. I'm not even entirely sure that we can get the drive down to the shuttle. Nate waved his wrench. Don't worry, I have that part. I have a cunning plan. After successfully removing the mounting bolt from the drive, Nate stood up and put the wrench back while Quirif and Alan finished working on their bolts. The only thing I don't get, Nate said, is that last clue, by the sea. Even after we found it, I don't get what that clue means. End of chapter. All about Linmeads, part 16. Surf the waves. Linmeads are well known for their relationship with their home world and a non-sapient species known as the Crackle. These tentacled creatures are curious and tradable. Linmeads insist that they make excellent pests and fishing companions. Crackle can even be trained to help drive fish to where the Linmeads are waiting with their fishing spears. Linmeads are also fond of a spot where they are pulled through the surf by their pet Crackle. Points are awarded for grace, speed, and color combinations of the team as they dart through the waves. Do me a review of ontological species studies, all about the Linmeads, Surf the Waves, published by Glass and Steel. Translation Engine 3.1415 I've got it, Nero said. By the sea. It means he left a ship by the sea, on the shoreline. I don't think so, Tate said. Steve wrote B-Y-E, and that means so long, farewell, goodbye. Maybe he's just a bad speller, Tariff said. Nate frowned at the mat. I hope not, but it just seems like it should be more. Tariff and Alan worked at removing the bolts a little longer before they popped off. Bubsy came over and inspected the new bolt-shaped cat toys, and Alan swooped in to pick them up before she could eat them. Captain Rackham said, My friend Steve was dying, I think, when he made this map. Maybe he was thinking about his own mortality, saying goodbye to the world, as it were. There was a moment of silence in response. Then Alan rocked the FTL drive experimentally. Well, that's heavy, he said, and Nerf wasn't sure if he meant the captain's comment or the FTL drive. Nate tried it too. Yeah, good thing we won't have to carry this thing back to the shuttle. Zoe cocked an eyebrow at Nate, who smiled. Don't worry, I have a plan, like I said. Nero started picking up the trash from the floor, the seats, the console, and the mic, and tossing it into a non-functional trash recycler. What are you doing? Quirif asked. If we're spending the night here, I don't want to spend it sleeping in someone else's old trash. Especially... She held one container up and sniffed cautiously at it from a distance. If it smells like this. If we're sleeping in the ship tonight, Zoe said, I don't think we'll need to set up a tent... But I'm open to trying to set it up around the ship if anyone wants it. Tariff wrinkled his nose. I don't see any point, especially since I'm not sure we have enough to go around the whole ship. Zoe nodded. It's dicey. We may have to belay enough, but I really don't see the need for them. And if we're sleeping indoors, it may be our last chance to get a full night's sleep between now and when the non-such comes back for us. Nerf noticed that Zoe was looking at Nate when she sent this and then glanced at Alan as she finished. 
Sure, as a swollen, always land, skin side down, Lara thought. Zoe, Nate, and Alan are keeping a watch tonight, but don't want anyone else to know. Tariff served dinner, and while they were eating, Nate said, Captain, can you tell us about Steve? What kind of man was he like? What is your best memory of him? Captain Rackham said he spoke down on his plate, wiped his mouth and smiled. Steve was crazy, pure and simple. He was an exchange student at our school and the first human I ever met, smart as anything, and even back then loved two things, pranks and adventures. One time, the head of the school told him he couldn't enroll in a coding class because he didn't have the requisite classes. Steve hacked his way into the school system, added his name to the roster for the class he wanted, and then changed the name of every other kid in the roster to Steve. When the head of the school came to extract him from the class, Steve said that he was signed up for the class and they must be after the other Steves. Since Steve was the only one whose full and correct name was on the roster, the teacher said he could stay. Captain Rackham smiled. He was a good guy. Uh, I don't know how he ended up doing off-books work for the glint. But with Steve, uh, the surest way to get him to do something was to tell him that he couldn't do it. After dinner, while Tariff was serving dessert, Nerev toyed with a sitting and a compad. After something delightful that Tariff called Death by Chocolate, Nerev, Bubsy, and Zoe went to sleep in one of the cabins. How come you get Bubsy? Tariff asked. Because we're having a girl's cabin, Zoe said, and Fubsy is a girl. Also, Nerif did all the cleaning, so she gets to have Fubsy tonight. I cooked, Tariff grumbled quietly. You can have Fubsy tomorrow, Zoe promised. Nerif picked the bed on the left, and Zoe took the bed on the right. Fubsy moved back and forth between the two, settling on Nerif, and then, after a few minutes, moving over to Zoe. And then back again. Nerif tucked a combat under her ribs and finally fell asleep. At about one in the morning, Bubsy booped Nerf on the nose. Bubsy, what are you doing? Nerf asked and rolled over. Bubsy started licking Nerf's feathers. Nerf pushed Bubsy away from her head. Ugh, Bubsy, that's icky. Nerf pulled the cover up over her head. Bubsy pounced on Nerf's feet under the blanket. Bubsy! Nerf sat up as the compad started vibrating. Bubsy started washing herself and Nerf turned off the alarm on her compad. She looked over at Zoe's bed and saw that it was empty. Is that why you were trying to wake me up? Nerf said as she petted Fubsy. Now, where did Zoe go? Let's go find her and see what she and Nate and Alan are up to. Nerf opened the cabin door and Fubsy followed in front of her, as cats do. The rest of the ship was dark and Nerf tapped a combat and used the light of the combat to shine a light around the main cabin. Zoe was sitting in one of the chairs and turned her face away from the light. Nerf, turn the light off, she said. Nerf thumbed the light down and sat down next to Zoe. What are you three up to? Nerf asked. Zoe looked at Nerf and smiled. You caught that. I don't know if I should be impressed at your insight or ashamed that we didn't do a better job at hiding what we were doing. Bubsy jumped up on Zoe's lap with a thump and oof from Zoe. We don't trust the captain. I like him. I think he's funny. But I don't trust him, Zoe said. So we're just keeping watch. Just in case. End of chapter. On to the story. All about the Linmuths, part 17. Timing. Linmuths in a given family group have a slightly different sleeping schedules. One person may be an early riser, another stays up very late, while a third one may wake for a few hours in the middle of the night for no discernible reason. This ensures that someone is awake at all times in any given family group which ensures that they are less likely to be caught unaware by a crack maw. It also makes for ideal watch and guard schedules if there are any Linmuths on the expedition team. Be sure to take their schedule into account when setting a watch list. Dubuque Review of Ontological Species Studies, All About Linmuths, Timing, published by Glass and Steel, All About Linmuths, Translation Engine 3.1415. They sat in the dark, Bubsy draped across Zoe's lap, purring, and working her claws in and out. After a long time, one of the cabin doors opened and Captain Rackham stepped out into the main cabin. He moved easily through the dark, heading towards the outer hatch of the ship. After sitting so long in the dark, Nerif's eyes were well adjusted to the lack of light, and she could see him reach his hand out for the electronic lock. Captain Rackham, Zoe said, and the captain froze. 
Zoe slid the lights up and Captain Rackham turned to face him. Zoe, there are fubs here. Uh, I, I didn't realize that the girls' cabin w- was actually going to be the main cabin, he said. Zoe tapped a compad and the door of the other cabins opened and Nate, Quirif, Alan and Tariff came out of their quarters. The captain was just about to explain why he was sneaking out of the ship in the middle of the night, Zoe said. Captain Rackham drew himself up. I was not sneaking out. I was going out in a quiet and respectful manner so as to not wake up everyone on the ship. He looked around at the assembled team, and Fubsy yawned, showing all of her teeth. Clearly, that did not work out as that I planned, uh, but I was not sneaking, he said with a great dignity. So, uh, what exactly were you doing? Nate said. He looked relaxed, leaning against the wall with his arms closed. The captain sighed. I was just thinking about what if Tariff said about not being able to scan the cone. I wanted to take a look at it and see if I could figure out how important it was. If it looks all that important, I, we could determine if there's a way to take it back with us. And you felt the urge to do this now? Zoe asked. Captain Rackham shrugged. I was awake. I was praying on my mind. Why not now? Well then, Zoe said brightly, let's go take a look. Now, Captain Rackham asked, and then held up his head. Wait, I, I know, wh- why not now? They went outside the ship and looked at the code attached to the front. Normally, FTL drives were based on a large parabolic dish in the back and pointed away from the ship. This ship had that as well, but it also had a much smaller parabolic dish attached to the nose of the ship, also pointing away from the body of the ship. The ship was lying on its side, but the nose cone was still a ways up in the air. Nerif tried to scan it with a compad, but couldn't get a scan to load, and when something did happen, the images were interlaced and unreadable. Nate looked at the compad results over her shoulder. Huh, he said. What is it? Nerif asked. It uh, looks like what happens to equipment during a solar flare, he said. Kruv was distracted from trying to scan the cone and looked up at Nate. Mind is a solar flare, because if that's what it sounds like, it does not sound good. Nate shrugged. Our sun does this thing every few years where it shoots out a bunch of radiation and it messes things up. Kruf cocked his head. Things? Computers, electronics, power lines, radios. Nate grinned a little. Things. And humans just live with that, Kruf asked. Well, uh, it's not like we had a lot of options, Nate said. Yeah, death world, I get it. So, are you saying that the planet star has flares like yours does? Captain Rackham asked. I don't think so, Nerif. Do you mind? Nate held his hand out for Nerif's compad. He took a few steps back and pointed the compad at the River Delta. It scanned fine. He pointed it at the dune. It scanned fine. He pointed it at the nose cone. And it fritzed. Nate handed the compad back to Nerif. So you're saying Steve's ship has a solar flare in his nose? Kurf said. No, not a solar flare in its nose. That would be silly, Nate said. More like an axe like a solar flare. What's the difference? Quirif asked. Well, one's silly and the other's plausible, Nate said. If, you know, you do some hand-waving, he said with another grin and a vague gesture with his hand. So, since the instruments don't work well around it, does that mean that it's a cloaking device? Tariff asked. Captain Rackham rolled his eyes. It's not a cloaking device, he said. When you're scanning for something, you find nothing. That's a cloaking device. When you're scanning for something and you find an interference signal, that's something, and it makes you take a second look. So, do you want to bring it with us? Zoe asked Captain Rackham. Your charter, your choice. Captain Rackham shook his head. I don't see how we can carry that and the FTL drive. Let's just stick with the FTL drive. Bubsy rubbed up against Nerf's knee and then yawned. So, we're, we're leaving it here. Does that mean we can all go back to bed? Nara asked. Zoe lifted an eyebrow in the direction of the captain. We can, he agreed. They all headed back into the ship, though Nara noticed that Nate wanted to make sure that he was the last one in. If there were any further telepathic glances between Nate and Zoe, Nara didn't see them. Everybody went back to bed. Or so it seemed and Nerif fell asleep with Fubsy stretched out next to her. Fubsy reached out one long leg and touched Nerif's face with her paw, as she was falling asleep. In the morning, Fubsy took it on herself to wake Nerif with another face boob. Nerif scrubbed her face and yawned, shaking her head. 
She looked at Zoe a little grumpily. How can you seem perfectly fine after being up in the middle of the night? Nera asked. Zoe laughed. Humans need sleep, don't get me wrong, but we can deal with a certain amount of sleep disruption. What Nate said last night about the radiation from your star, was that true? Nerif asked. Zoe paused in putting on her boots and looked at Nerif. Sure. Why? Do you think that nose cone thing is spitting radiation on us? Nerif asked. Zoe shook her head. That was one of the things Tariff checked for yesterday, when he did his initial scan. Then why does Nate think that the nose cone is like a solar flare? Nerif asked, hugging Fubsy for a moment for comfort. First, who knows why Nate does anything? Second, he didn't say that it was a soda flare, just that it affected our instruments the way a soda flare does, Zoe said. When they went out to the main cabin, Tariff was laying out breakfast, and Quirif and Alan and Nate were already eating. Nice of you to join us, Nate said, but guess who isn't joining us this morning? Zoe glanced at Captain Rackham's cabin, and the door was open. That rat bastard, she said, and her tone was almost admiring. End of chapter. All about the Linmeards, part 18. Naked Trust. Linmeards have few body taboos. They are comfortable both with and without clothes, don't ever wear swimsuits, and are relaxed about touching and being touched by others. They also memorize body taboos of other cultures, so they don't accidentally offend the one of their trade partners. Divic Review of Ontological Species Studies, All About Linmeards, Naked Trust, published by Glass and Steel, All About Linmeards, Translation Engine 3.1415. After breakfast, which might have been a little more rushed than usual, despite the respect that Terra's cooking deserved, the team left the ship to track down Captain Rackham. They tried leaving Fubsy in the girls' cabin, but Fubsy made a displeasure known both loudly and pitifully. Nerov looked at Zoe. I um, can't do it, she said. Zoe rolled her eyes. Fine, we'll bring her along. Bringing a kitten on a tracking job for a rogue captain. I'm sure there is no way for that to go wrong. So Fobsy came along too. As they stepped out of the ship onto the beach, the wind had picked up and ruffled Nerf's feathers, as well as kicked up the sand and blowing it across the dunes. I assume you're ready to check to see where his combat is, Zoe said. Alan nodded. Yeah, in his cabin. When we found out he was gone, we reran the surveillance to see what we could see. Nerif asked. There were surveillance videos? Yeah, Nate and I set up surveillance last night, inside and out. Because we didn't know what the captain was up to, Alan said. Now I hope you understand that the reason we didn't tell you is because you suck at keeping secrets. I suck at keeping secrets, Nerif said. And based on the fact that Alan took a step back, he knew that her voice had crossed over into the danger zone. Alan held up his hands, trying to calm Nerf down. It's nothing personal, and it's not just you. It's all on me. It's you're great team members in every way. But you can't hide things, and you can't lie. Which, really... Alan looked at Nate for support. Is a good thing. A really good thing. And one of the things that makes you such a good team members. Exactly, Nate said. We know that we can count on you. Zoe smiled that didn't say anything as the guys dug themselves deeper into the hole. You told them, Nerif said, and whirled, pointing at Anestas. They knew. No, Nerif, we didn't, Quirif said. His voice might have sounded a touch frantic. We just found out this morning like you. Nerif narrowed her eyes at him and then looked back at Nate and Alan. It's true, Nate said. I will have you know, Nerif said, that I lie to you every day, sometimes twice a day. Zoe turned her head and covered her mouth with her hand. Nate kept her eyes locked on Nerf and nodded. G -g -g Good to know, he said, and then glanced around at the team. I would never have known that. Uh, we um, uh, obviously and severely underestimated your ability in uh, de deception. Just you remember that, Nerf said. Now that I just settle, what did he take and where did he go, Zoe said. He didn't take anything. Not the FTL drive, not the SCO, not the droids, not even any of his gear, Alan said. What about the map? So he asked. The map? Nate asked. He started patting all his pockets. Yes, the map, Zoe said. Did he take the map? He might have taken the map, 
Nate said as he stopped patting his pockets and Zoe sighed. I still have an image of my compad, Tara said. Nate leaned over, grabbed Tara's head and pulled him down for a kiss on the forehead. I knew there was a reason to keep you around, besides your great cooking and handy culinary skills, Nate said. Tara pulled his copy of the map up and beamed it to the other compads. Okay, Alan said. Based on the surveillance, he was headed that way. Fallon pointed from the river delta. So that means, Nate said, holding his compad to a line with the captain's route, that he was heading for the shuttle, everyone said. Nate turned the map around and said, the shuttle, by way of the seashore. The team set out along the sea strand. If the captain had left any tracks, they would be wiped away by the wind and possibly the tide. Small cliffs rose on their right as they headed south to where the shuttle lay. The sand was wet enough that the wind didn't pick it up and blow it into their faces, but drops of water from the ocean did pelt them. Nerev tasted the salt spray on her lips and thought of home. We should move faster, she said. The tide is coming in, and we don't know what lives in this ocean. Before they had gotten much around the outer curve of the island, they could hear someone yelling for help. The captain was sitting in the ocean, water up to his waist. I thought you'd never come, he said. Nate swore and darted out to where the captain sat. Zoe and Alan were right after him, and the roofs close behind. The captain's leg was trapped under a rock slide from the cliff. There were a few smaller rocks around him, where he'd evidently been able to remove some of the rocks. He was sitting up and otherwise seemed well. Are you hurt anywhere? Except your leg, Nerev said. The captain shook his head. It's just my leg that's hurt. I'm sure glad that you got here before the tide came all the way in, though. I was afraid I was going to have to learn to grow gills. Alan, Zoe, and Nate started moving and tossing rocks from the captain's leg. It was a small rock side, but Nerev looked at the tide and the amount of rocks and turned to Ernestus. Quirv, Tariff, go back to the ship and see if you can locate the breathing mask. She ordered in a low voice. Be as quick as you can. Take Fubsy with you. They turned and started running for the shuttle, Bubsy scampering alongside. Nero turned back to the humans. She wasn't nearly strong enough to get rocks out of the way. She crouched down next to the captain. What were you doing out here by yourself? She asked. I knew we couldn't go back to the river route, he said. I wanted to see if going to the seashore was a better plan than trying to walk for days in the ravine. And um, why did you decide? Nero said with a smile. That this way is much nicer, more scenic and not as rugged, if you watch out for rock slides and uh, one of the reasons this world got a rating of three. I think it's a perfectly fine choice, he said. He pulled the map out from the upper pocket of his shirt and put it in Nero's hands. You hold on to this for me, will you, he said. He looked at the tide and the amount of rocks that the team had been able to move and said, Friends, that's enough. I don't want you to risk your lives over this. Like hell, Nate said. We're just getting started. I am the captain, he said. I'm ordering you to leave. Alan laughed. I'll spare you the details, but we don't take orders well. Nay, none of us do. Not anymore. Captain, Hera said. Really, there is no need for these heroics. The boys have gone back to Steve's ship for breathing gear. The humans know how to swim and are strong enough to move the rocks. And I will breathe for you if the boys don't get back in time. A particularly big wave engulfed the captain's head, and he shook his face, leaving drops of water in his beard. As you say then, my lady, the captain agreed. Alan took a deep breath and dived under the water to dig around the sand under the captain's leg. Zoe and Nate exchanged grim looks of determination and grabbed a big rock together to move it. When the next wave came in, Nerev took a deep breath and dipped her head under the water and found the captain's face and exhaled into his mouth. As the wave retreated, the captain gasped for a breath again. I think we can pull him out, Alan said. Zoe and Nate moved to grab the captain under the arms and pulled. For a moment, it seemed that nothing happened. And then, the captain broke free. They pulled him to his feet and he staggered a little. Nope, that leg's not gonna work, he said. No problem, Nate said. We got this. We do it all the time. He shot a grin at Nerf and then he and Alan picked the captain up between them and started heading back to the ship. Nerif and Zoe followed behind, bracing themselves as the wave came by. I feel terrible, 
Narif said. When I heard the captain had left in the morning, I'd assumed the worst. We were sitting around, eating breakfast, and he was trapped out here. He could have died. I don't think so, Zoe said. In fact, judging from the marks on the cliff face, I think that he set off the rock slide himself. When he could see that we were catching up on him, Narif stopped as the wave crashed through them. Zoe, that can't be right. He didn't have the compad to know where we were, and he gave me the map for safekeeping. He told us to leave him. First, so he said, all captains have at least two compads, one for the ship business and one for personal. I'm pretty sure that he had his own personal one with him, right up until we showed up. Now it's probably lost at sea. Second, she ticked off another point on her finger, he told us to leave, but he knew that we'd never do that. Telling us to leave him, even ordering us to leave him, just makes his story better. And last, so he said, where is the map? Lara fished a sodden mass of paper out of the pocket of a suit. I rest my case, so he said. He gave you paper and told you that it was a map. We'll never know what it was, but I can guarantee that he didn't give you the map. He's got it, and he's probably in a protector to prevent damage when he gets submerged by passing wave. Zoe so stopped and looked up, locking eyes with Nerif. Trust your instincts, Nerif, she said. You thought he'd run off on us for some reason. Trust that. He did. Part 19. Healing Techniques Linmeids, unlike most other species in the aggregate, actually heal faster in seawater. It's called wet wound healing, and seems to result in faster healing and fewer scars than traditional healing. There have been a number of attempts to replicate this style of wet wound healing on other species with limited success. Linmeids state that this is the mother of seas that make their waters more healing than just plain seawater. New studies are underway to see if there is some microbial action at work in the Linmead Sea water. The big review of ontological species studies all about Linmead's healing techniques, published by Glass and Steel, all about Linmead's translation engine 3.1415. As Nate and Alan carried Captain Rackham back to the ship, Kurif and Turf hurried towards them with masks slung over their shoulders. Mopsy wasn't with them. What happened? Tariff asked at the same time Quirf did. Is he okay? His leg is hurt, Alan said. We've got him. Uh, where's Bobsy? We convinced her to stay in Nerif and Zoe's cabin, Tariff said. I think that she decided she'd rather be there than back in the surf. And we brought the masks, Quirf said, holding out a bunch of masks like a catch of fish. Then he looked at the captain. It looks like you don't need them now, though. Taking the captain back to the ship was much faster than tracking him from the ship at Bind. A low-cowed clover had moved in, which cooled things off nicely and suggested that there might be rain. But none fell until just as they reached the ship. Zoe entered the ship first, sprinting ahead of everyone else. Once Nate and Alan brought Captain Rackham in, Zoe called to them from the medical bay and they carried the captain back to her and put him on the table. Zoe sliced open the captain's pant leg and Nera bit back a gasp. Captain Rackham, Zoe said. I don't know anything about troll physiology. How bad is this and what kind of treatment would you recommend? Captain Rackham propped himself up on one arm with a grimace and looked at his leg. His red skin grew paler and he lay back down on the table. Scan for broken bones, I think, he said. Nothing we can do about any breaks right now. Spray foam on the cuts. Start back for the shuttle tomorrow. We should take the seashore route. He closed his eyes and his voice grew softer. Not sure when the tides go out here, or for how long. Should have checked that before I left. While the captain was been talking, Zoe was scanning the captain's leg. Nerif, what do you think? Zoe said and beamed the scan to the large video wall. See here and here. This is what a good leg looks like. But here, the scans of his right leg show dark and light spots that I don't see in his left leg. Nerif nodded. I see the spots... What does it mean? Zoe leaned against the wall. I have no idea. I don't even watch medical shows. And unless Quirif or Terif are hiding medical skills that none of us know about, I don't think there's any way for us to know. Everyone looked at Terif, who he looked up to see everyone staring at him. What? He said. I don't have secret medical degree. Of course not, Terif said, then turned back to Zoe. 
I think the only thing that we can do is get him back to the shuttle as soon as possible. We will continue scan his leg and see if anything changes. The medical gear on the shuttle will at least have been designed for trolls in mine. Nate and Tariff had been applying pressure to the cuts on Captain Rackham's leg, while Kur sprayed foam to sterilize and glue the cut shut. Captain Rackham lay still on the table, but his breathing seemed steady. Gradually, his color returned and he regained consciousness. Nerf leaned over to him. How are you feeling? I've been better, he said, and then put his hand behind his head and smiled. I've been worse too. Uh, I remember after my first wedding, I thought I was going to die. Do you feel like you can sit up a little? Nerf asked. I do. The captain agreed and Nerf adjusted the bed to move into a sitting position while still trying to leave his leg slightly elevated. Since the bed had evidently been designed for human-sized bodies, Captain Rackham's feet hung over the end of the bed. Nate walked up and compad showing Tariff a copy of the map on it. Where did you... The captain started to say and then glanced at Nareff. Oh, you scanned it, clever girl. Nareff shook her head. I didn't have time to scan it. I'm afraid the one you gave me was destroyed by the water. Tariff had this copy on his compad. Well done, Tariff. Thank you, Captain, Tariff said, blushed the light shade of purple. Nerif remembered that he and Kurov had been fetching breathing masks when she and Zoe had talked about the captain's deceits. Tariff still liked the captain. We've been checking the map over, Blade said, because the river curved around, we're actually pretty close to the shuttle. If we were in all good shape, we could make it there by tonight. But since you're injured, Captain, I think that we should set off at first thing tomorrow. We can probably make it to the shuttle before dark. You're not going to carry him back to the shuttle at a dead run, are you? Asked Nerif, slightly horrified. It had taken two humans to carry Captain Rackham back to the ship. No, but I have to modify my cunning plan a bit, Nate said. Nerif could just hear the capital letters when he said it. Someone had let Fubsy out when they had gotten back to the ship, because she walked over to Nate and scratched out, begging to be picked up. Nate handed the compad over to Nerif and picked up Fubsy, rolling her on her back to give her tummy rubs. When she had enough, she grabbed his hand with her claws, not as gently as one could wish, and Nate set her back down on the floor. We have to work on it today, but it should be ready for tomorrow, Nate said. We'll still be able to take the FTL drive with us, right? Captain Rackham asked. We're trying to work that out. Right now, but uh, if not, we'll leave the FDL drive here and take you to the shuttle, Nate said. No, we need to take that back with us. It's our payload, Captain Rackham explained with a smile. Once we get to the shuttle, Nate said, we can come back and get it. You'll probably be more comfortable in the shuttle sick bay. Nate gestured to the captain's feet sticking out from the bed. I would add that, Captain agreed. Nerif joined the boys outside the ship later in the day. Look, you stupid droid, Nate yelled to the droids. Walk together. Do you understand? Left, right, left, right. The droids were walking around the ship with Kurov's raft tied to the top of them. This isn't as hard as a potato sack race, Nate yelled. And Alan's won two of those. Um, three, Alan said, not looking up from the compact. But I think I have a code worked out. Stand back, just in case. Nate hastily stepped away from the droids. Alan beamed commands from the compad to the two robots, and Nate whooped with joy when the droids started walking in tandem. We still need to cut the raft down to a smaller and more manageable size, Kurov called out. What is that contraption? Nate looked up and grinned. It's called a palanquin. It's for carrying royalty. But I think it will work to carry our wounded captain and the FTL drive too. End of chapter. Part 20. Betrayal. Linmeads don't deal well with betrayal, though really what species does, except for the glint. They have shown a magnanimous graciousness in the face of their own adversity with the aggregate. Linmeads, however, have shown a disturbing tendency to hold grudges weeks and even months after the incident. Do a review of ontological species studies all about the Linmead betrayal, published by Glass and Steel, all about Linmeads, Translation Engine 3.1415. The next morning, Fubsy booped Nerif on the head to wake her up. Fubsy, what are you doing here? 
You were sleeping with Tariff last night. Nerif rubbed her face and tried to pull her early morning thoughts in order. On one hand, it had been very lonely not sleeping with either Fubsy or Ernestus. On the other hand, she did love being able to roll over without worrying about squishing anyone else. Fubsy booped Nerif again, and Nerif noticed that Zoe was already gone from her bed. Nerif got dressed and stepped out of her cabin. There was a bustle of activity and packing, while Tariff was serving a warm breakfast that looked like inkfish wraps. Nerif grabbed one gratefully and looked at Tariff, who was packing away his cooking kit. How's the captain doing? she asked. Tariff shrugged. He seems fine. Zoe scanned his leg this morning and she said there wasn't any change. We'll be taking off in a few minutes. Zoe said that you were already packed and to let you sleep until just before breakfast. Thanks for using Fubsy to wake me up, Nerif said after swallowing her bite of warm inkfish. It wasn't really inkfish, and she knew it. One of Tariff's gifts was turning Sea Reach Carnival Paste No. 3 into something that looked and tasted like home. Tariff didn't answer, and Nerif glanced over to see that he'd already moved his kit over to the droids and was loading it. Nerif took the hint and grabbed her gear and packed it into the droid too. Once the droids were packed and the palanquin was attached to the top of them, Nate and Alan went back to the ship to bring Captain Rackham out. Tariff followed them to get Fubsy, and Zoe was making the final sweep of the ship to make sure that they weren't leaving anything behind. Kurif and Nerif waited by the droids. Then Kurif said, The captain's been lying to us, or hiding something from us, hasn't he? Nerif looked at Kurif in surprise. Did Nate or Alan say anything to you? Kurif shook his head and looked away. No, I've just been feeling I've been getting. Something isn't right. Nerif hugged her Nesta with one arm and leaned her head on top of his. I'll tell you the same thing Zoe told me. Trust your phoenix. Nate and Alan came out with the captain and loaded him on top of the palanquin. They went back into the ship to bring out the FTL drive. Tariff had his hands full with Fubsy, who was evidently in a playful mood and wanted to treat Tariff like her own personal climbing tree. When the FTL drive was put on top of the palanquin, the droid staggered a bit. It's too much for them, Captain Rackham said. The weight is just too much. I'll walk. He started to move off the palanquin and winced when he moved his leg. You'll stay right there is what you'll do, Tariff said, from under Fubsy's attempt to climb onto his head. Tariff turned to the group. We can take the captain to the shuttle and then some people can come back in here and get the FTL drive. Not a plan, Captain Rackham said, as everyone else said no. Okay, Tara said, with only a blink at the strong response. How about we stay here, Kurif and one or two of the others, go get the shuttle and bring it back here. Kurif shook his head as Captain Rackham said, The shore isn't big enough to land the shuttle. She's not one of your fancy VTOLs. That's how we were able to afford so many shuttles. Look, Nate said, it's time. The droids are fine. They're just finding their feet with the additional weight. Aren't you guys? Nate bent over to address the last part of the comment of the droids. See, he said, they're fine. We're going to have to get along if we want to beat the tide. All in all, the walk back to the shuttle wasn't bad at all. There was a moment when Fubsy refused to walk on the sand, but Terra picked her up and carried her. After a few minutes, she forgot that she didn't like walking on wet sand, and only remembered that she didn't want to be carried anymore. At one point, she jumped up onto the palanquin next to Captain Rackham, and the droids staggered again, but regained their footing. Come on, Fubsy, Alan said. Come down off of there. Leave the nice captain alone. Fubsy jumped down in exchange for the pet's promise by the wheedling tone of his voice. She was fine up there, Alan. If she wants to be carried again, you're the one who's going to have to do it, Tariff said. She may have been fine, Alan said, but I don't want to stress the droids with anything additional. See? Alan showed the droid diagnostic that he'd been viewing on his compad, and Nerif saw instantly what had Alan worried. Do you think there's enough power for them to make it? Nerif asked. Alan shrugged. It looks close. By the middle of the day, we should have a better idea. We may have to unload some things from the droids. The batteries just weren't expected to hold this much weight. By the middle of the day, it seemed much clearer that the droids probably wouldn't have enough power to make it all the way back to the shuttle. I uh, think that the sand is harder, Alan said. That and the extra weight 
and not being able to recharge through even a little solar charging, Alex shrugged. They broke for lunch. The cliffs had given away to dunes again, and the palanquin was removed from the droids in the hope that they could get a little extra power from solar charging. While Tariff made lunch, everyone else unloaded their things from the droids. Zoe seemed to have no trouble leaving her stuff behind. Nate loaded a few things into his backpack. Alan piled everyone's stuff and built a cairn to protect it. In case we come back, he said. The one that had the hardest time was Tariff. He stroked his knives. I just caught them, he said. They're such a nice set and balanced perfectly. They keep a great edge. Watch this. He tossed a leaf in the air and swiped at it with his cleaver and two pieces drifted down to the ground. Bubsy promptly grabbed one of the leaf pieces and then split it out and rubbed her face with a paw. We'll give your knives a special spot in the cairn, Alan said, right on top, so if we come back they'll be the first things you see. Tariff nodded glumly. I just don't want to watch. He turned his back on the cairn as Alan put the kit in the cairn. Nerf saw Nate put his finger on his lips and then pulled Tariff's knives out of the kit and slipped them into his backpack, dumping out whatever it was that he'd stuck in his backpack originally. After lunch, they loaded the droids back up with the palanquin, the FTL drive, and Captain Rackham. Captain Rackham had been sleeping a lot, Nerf noticed. He hadn't even eaten most of his lunch and slept instead. The droids stepped a little better with a lighter load, and they were able to make good time to the shuttle. The captain seemed better in the bed on the shuttle. Now we just wait, so he said. I think it's two more days before the non-such is supposed to be back to get us. Great, Tara said. We can go back and get the cairn and my knives. Actually, Nate said, slipping his pack to the floor and started to reach in. Captain, please reply. Captain, this is the non-such. Please reply. The voice on the speaker seemed tired, as though they'd been doing this with the periodic intervals for a while now. Zoe answered the hail. This is Zoe. The captain has been injured. We can take off on your mark. Thank goodness, the voice said. The shuttle bay is ready and we will have the medical team standing by. Everyone strapped in and checked to make sure that everything was battened down. Quirf jumped into the pilot seat and Alan grabbed the co-pilot seat. Quirf said, okay to take off. Captain's belted in and Fubsy is harnessed. Everyone else is belted. You're good to go. The captain woke up in the shuttle, docked to the bay. It's okay, Arrow said to him. We're back on the non-such. About time, he said in a grumpy voice. Quirif opened the shuttle loading door and Alan headed out to coordinate the medical team. He stopped at the top of the ramp and lifted his hands. What's this? Zoe said and reached for her weapon, but it was too late. The medical team boarded the shuttle, weapons at the ready, and Captain Racken hopped out of the bed. Is everything ready? He asked Dr. Livesey, and the doctor nodded, but cast a guilty look at the expedition team. What is the meaning of this? Nate demanded. Captain Rackham turned to Nate. No matter what happens next, have faith. Tariff said, but your leg. Captain Rackham smiled. Trolls are tough. End of chapter. When entering into a contract with another species either as an expedition team or as a trade partner. Linmeards like to celebrate with a sharing of food. If that food is special to either side, so much the better. The Linmeards are widely known as a species able to tolerate the widest range of foods. There are rumors that humans are true omnivores, but these rumors will be finally settled in our next book, The Care and Feeding of Humans. Do we a review of ontological species studies all about Linmeards, tea and sympathy, Published by Glass and Steel, all about the Linmeads, Translation Engine 3.1415. Captain Rackham picked up Fugsy, and one of the trolls started putting manacles on them, one by one. Nero's mouth went dry. The threat was implicit, though all he did was pet her. Bubsy didn't seem to mind, and rubbed her cheek against Captain Rackham's beard. Don't be foolish, Captain Rackham said. I want to get through this without anyone getting hurt. I am having you restrained until we can put this whole episode behind us. Nerf could see the muscle in Nate's jaw working, and for a moment she was afraid the stories were true and that Nate was going to conject acid on everyone. Instead, he just spoke, but his voice was so flat and calm that it made Nerf's mouth go dry. You're making a mistake, Nate said, one which you will regret. 
I've made many mistakes, my friend, Captain Rackham said. I hope that this is not one of them. Captain Rackham turned to his crew. Take them to their cabin and stand guard. The captain looked at the expedition team. Stand down, he told them. Bubsy will be with me until this is concluded, and then she'll be returned to you, safe as the day you all came aboard. The crew prepared to take the team to the cabin. The door opened, and Nate took a deep sniff. That smell. Just then, Fubsy hissed. Captain Rackham swore and turned to face the door, still holding Fubsy. Captain Rackham, said the glint as he walked through the door. Are you prepared to turn over the FTL drive? I will kill you, Nate said as the glint turned to face him. Amusement clear on his face. Three humans, <laughs> he said. A gift. Nerif didn't miss the short gasp from Zoe, or the small sound from Anand. The humans are mine, Captain Rackham said. You get the FTL drive in exchange for my family. I get the humans in place of our lost profits and cargo. He set Bubsy carefully on the floor and extended his hands in a peaceful gesture. Everyone wins. He glanced at the expedition team and amended his statement. Almost everyone wins. The glint nodded. As you say, then. He made an imperious gesture to someone waiting in the hall, and six more glint came into the bay and picked up the FTL drive. Nerv had met glint before, but she'd never noticed this smell before. With seven glint in the shuttle bay, she was aware of the smell of rotten meat and the sugary sweetness that made her want to throw up. A damn half deal is locked at the aggregate, Captain Rackham said as the glint started to leave. The leader of the glint stopped, but didn't turn around. No need to remind me. He made another gesture, and all three troll children walked into the bay, holding hands. They might have seemed calm. But Nerev could see the knuckles of the smallest one were white with how hard they were gripping a brother's hand. I hope you will log this as successfully completed as soon as possible, the glint said as he walked away. The door closed behind him and the children broke to a ran for the captain. He hugged them, assured them that they were all right, and then stood and touched his ear. Are they gone? Captain Rackham asked. Good. Let me know the instant they transition to FTL. He turned and looked at the crew. Dr. Livesey and Rogers were both hugging the children. Nerf noticed. Everyone out. I have some negotiations to conclude with our expedition team. The children were hustled from the room and the rest of the crew left. Rogers paused at the door. Are you sure you've done a cost-benefit analysis on this? She asked. Captain Rackham nodded irritably. And logged it. Go. You the children... Captain Rackham turned to the team and bowed. Not the curtly, flashy bow that he had greeted them with when they boarded the ship, but simple bow of apology. I know that I have earned death at your hands. I accept it, but I hope that you will listen to my story, and maybe we can find a negotiation that will not require my death, Captain Rackham said. You accepted a deal with the glint. You gave them an FDL drive that was powerful enough, by your own words, to get them fully accepted back into the aggregate. You threaten Fuzzy. Do you think there is anything you can say to us that will prevent us from killing you? Asked Zoe. Her voice was tight and she held her chin up, though her hands were still bound behind her. I did. It will not. I did not, he said. He unfastened Quirf and handed him the keys and gestured at the rest of the team. As Quirif released Nate, Nate leapt across the room and in one smooth move seized one of Tariff's knives from his backpack and barreled into the captain, knocking him to the floor. Nate held the knife to the captain's throat. Give me one reason to not kill you. Revenge, Captain Rackham said, still lying. Revenge against the glint. Nate, Tariff said, I really like that knife. I won't be able to use it again if you get the captain's death on it. Nate pulled the knife away from the captain's throat and stood up. He turned back to Tariff and handed him the knife. Surprise, Nate said. I saved your knives for you. Thank you, Tariff said gravely. The captain stood up and said, Will you hear my negotiation? Nate looked at each person and read their faces and turned back to the captain. We will. We'll still probably kill you when you're done. First, I have not lied to you, though I have not always been completely forthcoming. 
Alan muttered, I think we figured that out. Captain Rackham didn't hear Alan or pretended not to. My friend Steve actually invented the technology that would allow an FTL ship to land on a planet years ago. He sold it to me, and I have found it very useful in certain situations for our business. Alan snorted, I'll bet. I don't think Steve knew that he was working for the Glint. I think that he was offered a position where he couldn't invent new technology, and he didn't stop to look at who was paying for it. I'm sure that once he found out it was the Glint, that's when he stopped and ran. The Glint approached me. I assumed they knew about our past relations. Of course, I turned them down. Then, uh, they, uh, what is the expression? Made me an offer that I couldn't refuse. They kidnapped three of our children. Captain Stone was even, but Nerev could see the hard look in his eye. He might be playing it calm and relaxed, but his eyes revealed his true feelings. They proposed a deal. They get Steve's FTL drive and I get our children back. They were even agreeable to lock it with the aggregate, leaving out the details of the kidnapped children, of course. The captain looked down at his hands, which had been tightened into fists. He consciously flexed them and then looked up again. I would have done anything to save the children. I hide you. I hoped that I would be able to tell you the true nature of what was happening once we entered FTL. What I hadn't expected was a note that I received the morning after we entered FTL. The Glint had an agent on my ship. I don't know who it was. I didn't know how to warn you of the danger that we were in without giving you details that might violate the terms of my contract with the Glint. I had one of my crew break into your cabin in such a way as to be caught by you so that you could figure out that we had a mole. I didn't tell you, and so didn't violate the terms of our contract. Bubsy walked over to the captain and rubbed her face just above his knee. The captain looked surprised. My lady, I do believe you've grown bigger during our acquaintance. How did logging the deal with the aggregate help you? Zoe asked. Before the captain could respond, Kurov said, It is the ultimate trust creator. The captain knows that he and his family and crew won't be killed as soon as the deal is done. If he doesn't log the completion of the deal with the aggregate, they will take it to mean that the Clint violated the terms of the contract. They are already in deep water with the aggregate. Violating the contract would heavily prejudice any attempt by the Glint to rejoin, especially if the contract was in relation to the very thing the Glint were trying to use as a way to get back in. Doesn't it leave, I don't know, a paper trail, showing the Glint kidnapped children to force this negotiation? Adam asked. Captain Rackham shook his head. The kidnapping is our words against theirs. We have no proof. So, um, now they just show up with a new FTL drive and get back into the aggregate, Nate said bitterly. Well, um, Captain Rackham said with a smile, they uh, won't actually be able to do that. You see, I had several members of my family register our FTL drive with the aggregate. Plus, um, we have Steve's notes and documentation given to us. What's the word? Provenance, Zoe said. You established provenance for your ownership of the device. She sounded a little stunned. Just so, agreed the captain. When the Glint try to log it with the aggregate in the next day or two, they'll be arrested for attempting to steal ownership of our property. I had you locked up before Adam showed because I was afraid that you'd kill him before completing our deal by returning the children. I held Flubsy because I wasn't sure how she would react when she saw Glint. And I let her go after I was sure she wouldn't go near him and be accidentally hurt. I implied to him that I would be using your adrenaline for a drug trade to compensate for our lost cargo. This let them think that trying to take away from me would lead to grievance before the aggregate. Harvesting adrenaline from humans isn't illegal unless it's done without their knowledge and permission. So, um, Captain Rackham dipped his head to say. To answer your objections, I did enter into a deal with the Glint to save my children. Giving them the FTL drive will not give them a path back into the aggregate. I did not threaten Trubsy, and I never will. I would like to propose a new contract. Join my crew, at least long enough for us to exact revenge on the Glint. They should never be allowed to think of using children as coin again. Zoe glanced at each team member. We'll need to discuss this overnight. We will have an answer for you in the morning. But one question. Who damaged our weapons? The captain shrugged. I haven't caught the real mole. I assume that he was the one that did that. Nerev saw doubt in Zoe's face. And evidently the captain saw it too. 
I've been honest with you as I could to save the lives of my children, except for this one thing. He pulled out a book that he'd been reading during the game of truth or embarrassing action. It's not porn, he said. It's a book I'd been reading to our children before they were kidnapped. He set the book down so that they could read the title. Treasure Island. End of chapter. March 22. The Long Goodbye. Lin Mids have an entire rituals built around saying goodbye. When visiting Lin Mids on their home world, leaving is usually the least three-day process. Even parting after a meal can take as long as the meal itself. The idea of a long parting appears to be based on the fact that a tide takes a long time to go out. So, if you're traveling to the Lin Mead homeworld, be sure to factor in at least three extra days of food and song to say goodbye. Do a review of ontological species studies all about Linmead's The Long Goodbye, published by Glass and Steel. All about Linmead's translation engine 3.1415. Terra pricked up the book and looked at the cover for several long seconds before he looked up at Captain Rackham and said, What happened to your leg? Captain Rackham coughed. Eh, I was not injured as I appeared to be. Trolls are not as hardy as humans, but we are pretty tough. The rock ball caused damage, but nothing life-threatening. The glint logged your deal with the aggregate, Quirf said. They said that they get the FTL drive from the crash site, but it couldn't be logged unless they were stated what you were getting. We know it didn't say children, so what did it say? We were allowed to keep the rest of the ship as payment, while the Glint wanted Steve's FTL technology. I was far more interested in Steve's stealth technology. Landing an FTL ship on a planet is well and good, but it's still more cost-effective to use a shuttle. But stealth technology? The captain cocked his head. That would be very helpful to people in our line of work. However, salvage laws still apply, so I can only count on keeping what I could carry with me. I was able to access his data chips when we got off his ship, and I smuggled them aboard the nonsuch by test smuggling them past you. I inserted them into my wounds on my leg. That's uh, pretty hard to call, Nate said. So, uh, those were the spots we saw in your scan, so he said. They were data chips. I am hoping that we can access the data after Dr. Liversay extracts them from my leg. It may take a while to guess Steve's password. He loved coding in a computer language called uh, C. I don't suppose any of you know that language. Captain Rackham looked hopefully at the team. You are operating under the assumption that we will help you, Annan said. I don't think we've reached that consensus yet. The captain tipped his head in agreement. Your bracelets are by the door. You are free to wear them or leave them. You are allowed to every part of the ship. I hope you all will join me at breakfast at eight bells tomorrow. But for now, I must have these data chips extracted. It was perhaps no surprise to them that the team found themselves back at their quarters. It was less than a couple weeks since they had been here, but everything felt strange. Bubsy decided that everything needed to be investigated and proceeded to do so with enthusiasm. Narrow sat down, but Zoe didn't. She still was rubbing her wrists where her manacles had been. She walked in furious movements around the room until Fubsy came over and begged to pick up. What we have here, Tara said, is a classic P versus NP problem. Do we trust the captain or not? Zoe's arm and attention were full of Fubsy, but at Tara's words she stopped and looked at him. That's exactly it. There are so many unanswered questions. I mean, no, he can spell a tale. But do we trust anything he says? Do we need to? Nates asked. If he wants to hurt the glint, I'm on board. I have my own reasons. I don't need his reasons. But do we want to work with him? Nara asked. Is there any way that we could trust him, so that we could work with him? Now that Zoe had picked Fubsy up, Fubsy wanted to go down again, and struggled her way out of Zoe's arms. She headed over to Alan and demanded that he pick her up. Here's the problem, Zoe said. He could have told us what was going on a thousand times and in a thousand ways. Why didn't he? Nareth chewed a lip a bit and said, I think you're thinking of him like a human. 
Charles Zal, he, she shrugged helplessly. Not human. I can't think of another species that is more family-oriented. His children were at stake. He would literally do anything to save them. Trolls are only hired in three mated groups of three. I can't imagine humans wanting to be around their families so much that they would only be hired in family groups. Plus, they don't make individual decisions. Every decision is discussed and evaluated. It can take weeks. I don't think he had consensus from his mate group to tell us what was going on. So he tried, in the only way that he knew how, to let us know that there was a Clint spy on board. So, uh, what you're saying, Alan said, is that we can't just meet with the captain tomorrow. We need to meet with his whole mate group. We need a consensus of honesty and fair dealing with them. And we need that in our contract. If we go seek revenge on the glint, I believe we do, Nerf said. Nerf, honey, you're so sweet that sometimes I forget that you're our liaison, Nate said. That actually makes sense, Kurf said. So, do we want our next job to be revenge on the glint, and how much time are we willing to devote to that, if we do? Revenge, Zoe said, in a tired voice and rubbed her face. I'm tired, Banker and Nate. I'm tired of carrying it all around all the time. I don't think I want revenge on the glint anymore. She looked at Nate. I'm sorry, Nate smiled. How about we skip revenge and just go to teaching our dumb a lesson? Children are not to be used as poker chips. So he smiled. That I can do. How about everyone else? Nerf looked around at the team and said, We're all agreed. I will tell the captain to have his mate group present at our breakfast meeting. The meeting at breakfast went well. The mate group had reached consensus about the team and offered Halloclaw to them all, even Fubsy. What is Halloclaw? Zoe asked Nerf in an aside. It means they treat us as though we are family, Nerf said. Well, that sounds good, Zoe said, a little doubt in her voice. Nerf nodded. I think they're trying to make up for not reaching consensus about us before and putting us in the presence of the glint. It's not something offered to non-trolls very often, as you can imagine, and it gives a full disclosure we want going forward. The team accepted the contract to teach Adam and not to use children in any future negotiations with any species. Were you able to figure out Steve's password? Nate asked the captain. We have not, Captain Racken said, but I have confidence that it'll be able to resolve it. I think I know what it is, Nate said. I think I finally figured out that I lost clue on the map. The captain raised an eyebrow. Do tell. The clue by the sea, Nate reminded him. You said that Steve liked a program in a language called C. Well, that's pronounced the same, even if it's not spelt the same. Then you said that it's pretty contrary. The clue said pie, and the opposite of pie is hello. And when you're learning to program, the first program you create is... Nate pointed his hand at the captain and awaited. Captain Rackham shrugged. Zoe groaned and said, Hello, world. Nate grinned and nodded. Try, hello, world, and see if we get you in. As they were getting ready to leave the captain's quarters, Tariff said, I think the first thing we need to do is find your mole, captain. Nate threw an arm around Tariff's shoulders and said, Now you're starting to think like a human, Tariff. Good job. Nerf hung back while everyone else left until she and the captain were the only ones in the room. Captain Rackham, she said, as a liaison, I have something to tell you, officially. And what would that be? Captain Rackham asked. If you ever pull anything like that again on us, I don't care what your excuse is. I will kill you, and I will say that it was an accident, and everyone will believe me, because I am a Linmead and it is well known that we are terrible liars. Do I make myself absolutely clear? The captain nodded and Nera smiled. And it's a good thing that we have a contract logged with the aggregate that specifies fair and honest dealings, isn't it? Then Nera left the room without looking back. There was a little swagger in her step. The captain didn't notice. The end. Just a quick shout out to the T5 peeps. 
Bob the Dragon, Cat Crab Lobster, Data Magnet, Dark Machine, Mezik, Try Again 95, Feudic Yol, Astraea the Dreamer, Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Athelia, Meridian 117, and Jordan Buxmorm. Thank you very much. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.